So what I want to do now is give you a little bit of background on what the jhanas are, and then I'm going to give you the instructions for the first jhana. But don't expect to get to the first jhana. You sort of need like a 10-day retreat and get quiet enough to do that. Um, but at least you'll have some idea of what's required, where you're aiming at, and so forth. So the jhanas are eight altered states of consciousness that are brought on by concentration and each yield even more concentration. This enables you to stair step your way into deeper and deeper levels of concentration. In other words, you're in the first one, which gives you enough concentration to get to the second one, which gives you enough concentration to get to the third one, etc. Now, concentration is the usual translation of the Pali word samadhi. However, it has this furrowed brow connotation to it. Perhaps a better translation would be indistractability, which I don't think is a real English word. Okay, but the ability to not become distracted. Right? You sit down to meditate. You might have noticed this in the last 45 minutes, right? Your mind just sort of went all over the place. Some of the distractions come from outside, a sound or something like that. Some come from your body, right? Your knee hurts or whatever. But probably most of them come from your mind, right? We have this thing called the default mode network. Neuroscience has determined that when we got nothing else to do, we start running this network. And it ties together multiple parts of the brain that have to do with the sense of self. So if we got nothing else to do, we apparently sit there thinking of ourselves. Right? And you might have heard Buddha said something about not self, right? And so part of the meditation thing is to you know, stop running the default mode network. So every time you're distracted, basically you just fell into running the default mode network. The number one antidote is mindfulness. Right? Paying attention to what's happening in the here and now. When you're meditating, you are to pay attention to the breathing, or if you're doing a body scan, the body sensations, or if you're doing metta practice, the feeling of love. Right? In doing that, you're not distracted. And what's necessary to inner the jhanas is to generate enough of this indistractability so that you actually can enter these altered states. So this level of indistractability that gives you access to the jhanas goes by the term access concentration. It's enough concentration or indistractability to give you access to the jhanas. We could define it as being totally with the object of meditation, such that if there are thoughts, they are wispy and in the background and not dragging you off to distraction. Okay? So you sit down and the first thing you do is you start planning your trip to Hawaii. The first thing I'm going to do is the beach I'm going to make, right? Okay. Distraction. You come back. And then you argue with your boss a little bit and have distraction. You come back. This is a strategy. You sit down. I won't say it's impossible to force your mind to stay with the object, but it's not useful because your mind gets so tight. It's just not a useful thing to do. The strategy is to detect when you become distracted and come back. And just keep coming back. If you can do that long enough, then eventually you come back and you don't go away anymore. You're fully with, say, the breathing. You know each in-breath, you know each out-breath, and the thoughts are more like, oh, this is good. Is this what he was talking about? As opposed to Hawaii or your boss or something like that. And so the definition of access concentration is fully with the object of meditation. And if they're thoughts, they're not pulling you into distraction. Okay. 
most people find that to get to access concentration on a regular basis, they need to go on longer treatment. Right? So most of the retreats I teach are 10 days or longer. You go on a retreat, you spend the first four days arguing with your policy planning, your shift to Hawaii, and rearranging the contents of your refrigerator, and all sorts of stuff. And then eventually it starts to settle in about day four for most people. And some people get there faster, some people, oh, it never happens. But somewhere around day four, things start to settle in, and you start beginning to get to access concentration. Not every sit, but, you know, multiple times a day. There are some signs that can show up besides the not getting distracted that can indicate that you're getting to access concentration. <coughs> One of the signs is a diffuse white light. Or you close your eyes right now and it's dark, right? And then you start meditating and maybe you get some purple blobs, uh, maybe laser light show. Right. These are signs you're sort of beginning to get distracted. But if you get the diffuse white light, like you're meditating, it seems like somebody's inching up the dimmer switch, or you're meditating and the sun came out, right? you get this sort of brightness there. That's a sign of good concentration. There's nothing you need to do with it. It's just a sign. I mean, when you came to San Francisco and you saw the signs that San Francisco city limits. You didn't have to get out of your car. And out. You just knew where you were. Same thing if you get the diffuse white light. Some people get the diffuse white light every time they get concentrated. Some people never get the diffuse white light, no matter how concentrated they get. And most people see it sometimes when they get concentrated, and sometimes they don't. So if you don't see it, it doesn't mean anything. If you do see it, yeah. It's a sign. You can come to San Francisco and there's no sign saying entering San Francisco. You, know, you can come to concentration and not get the diffuse white light. But if you see it, right, you've got some good indistractability going. If you're using the breath as your object of meditation, one of the signs there is that the breath changes. You sit down, it's normal breathing, and then it begins to get a bit slower, perhaps a little deeper. And then it begins to get slower still, and it doesn't seem like you're breathing very much. Maybe it gets to like, I need to take a deeper breath. At that point, don't take a deeper breath. <laughs> That's a sign of really good concentration. The taking of the deeper breath, if the breathing going again, is actually going to take you away from the jhanas. I don't know for certain, but it does appear that the entry into the first jhana is accompanied by either an increase in carbon dioxide in your stream, in your bloodstream, or a decrease in oxygen. One of those seems to be a contributing factor. We don't know which. We just sort of know that, okay, that seems to happen. So if your breath gets really shallow and you take a deep breath, you just put yourself away from the job. There's a trick. Forget about the breath. Yeah, I know. You sit down and you're working with your breathing, you're all distracted. Finally, you can stay with your breath. And then it gets shallow, and now you're told not to stay with your breath. Okay? The trick is to switch your attention to a pleasant sensation. Now, you might be wondering, what pleasant sensation? Well, if you can smile when you meditate, put a fake smile on your face when you start, by the time you get to access concentration, the smile will feel genuine. And you only got to shift your attention one inch if you're following your breath <laughs> at the nostrils. Notice the Buddha statues, they all got a little smile. It's not there just for artistic purposes. It's a teaching. The act of smiling generates endorphins. Endorphins make you feel good. Feeling good makes you smile. It's a positive feedback loop. Right? 
Now, even if your breath doesn't get to the really shallow, if you can get to access concentration, that is you're with the object of meditation, and you're not getting lost in distractions, and stay there for five to 10 to 15 minutes, then you wanna do the same trick, which is to let go of your object, like the breath, and put your attention on a pleasant sensation, like the smile. Right? And then comes the really, really difficult part. Once you put your attention on the pleasant sensation, do nothing else. <laughs> you can't actually do the jhanas. All you can do is set up the initial conditions and they arise on their own. The indistractable focus on pleasantness is all it takes for the jhana to arrive. And anything else that you do gets in the way. You can't help it. Right? Now, I'm telling you, focus on the smile. The smile, when it works, works really well. Unfortunately, it only seems to work for about 25% of the students I work with. The most common place that people find a pleasant sensation is in the hand. Sort of a warm, tingly glow. All right, so you're following your breathing. You've been there for a while without distraction, or your breath has gotten problematic, sort of going away. Then shift your attention to the pleasantness of that experience in your hand. What you're looking for is the pleasantness of the pleasant sensation. So it's not where it is or how strong it is, or how long it's been there, or whether it's increasing or decreasing, it's just the fact that it's pleasant. And to determine the pleasantness, just think, how do I know this is pleasant? It's a warm, tingly glow. If somebody asks you, is that pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, and you go, it's pleasant. How do you know it's pleasant? Whatever it is that enables you to know it's pleasant, that's what you focus on. Okay. Other possible places for pleasant sensation are the heart, particularly if you're doing metta as your access concentration. Okay. Metta is a very good concentrating practice. You can do it with phrases. That's usually how it's taught. You can do it with visualizations visualizing the people that you're sending the metta to and giving them flowers perhaps or wishing them well. Uh, you can just focus on the feeling. Right? And after half an hour, you'll have a warm, tingly glow in your heart. You stop doing the metta practice and just focus on the pleasantness of the warm, tingly glow. Some people find the third eye gets excited when they get concentrated. And it's pleasant, and focus on that. Top of the head, top of the shoulders, soles of the feet. You name a body part, and I've had some student find a pleasant sensation there that they were able to ride into the first genre. Okay. And it's, it's really simple. You know, sit down, get yourself collected, put your attention on your object of meditation, breath, metta, body scan, whatever. If you get distracted, it can be helpful to label the distraction, planning, worrying, wanting, nonsense. First label is always correct. It's been zero effort trying to get the perfect label. You'll get the perfect one 90% of the time. And it's a label of distraction and then very important, relax and come back to your object of meditation. And you just keep doing that until it settles in. And then you stay with that for five or 10 minutes. And then you turn your attention to a pleasant sensation and do nothing else but enjoy the pleasant sensation. If you can do that, the pleasant sensation will increase in intensity. Not much, just a bit. And if you can just keep focus, it will increase a little more and a little more and a little more and a little more until it explodes into the Pali words are piti and sukha. 
PP gets translated as rapture, euphoria, ecstasy, delight, interest. My favorite translation is glee. <laughs> it's got a, some excitement to it. And it's pleasant. It has a definite physical component. To make you sit up really straight. Uh, make your hair stand on end. Make your muscles get really tense. Okay. And then sukha is the emotional component that accompanies it. And best translated as joy or happiness. There's quite a lot of variety in how the PP and the Sukha manifest for some people. Common translation is rapture, but I would say far less than half the people report their PP as rapturous. It's, it's a physical release of energy that hopefully is pleasant. If it's accompanied by Sukha, joy or happiness, then yeah, the energy will be pleasant. It can be quite intensely pleasant, so pleasant that it's not even pleasant anymore. Mm -hmm. right? Just really intense, finger in the light socket. Intense. Okay, uh, and then the happiness, the joy, can be yeah, brings a slight smile to your face to where you're grinning like a maniac. Right, teeth showing, and just you know, it's just you're. Outrageously happy for no other reason other than you're really concentrated, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. Right? The happiness turns out is inside of you. It's not in whatever triggers the happiness from the external world. It's just the trigger. Mm -hmm. So it's simple, right? Get concentrated, put your attention on a pleasant sensation, do nothing else. Here you go, first job. Uh, easy to describe. There, be problems that arise along the way. The most common problem is jumping too soon. I followed three breaths in a row. Where is that pleasant sensation? Right? So it takes patience. Like I said, on a 10-day retreat, you know, most people don't start learning jhanas till the retreat's kind of over, you know, day five or after. It just takes a while to get that deep, that settled. So Stick with the access concentration when you get there for, well, I say five to 10 to 15 minutes, which is really indefinite because your sense of time is totally messed up by you. Right? But just stay there for a while. And then you switch your attention to the pleasant sensation. When you switch to the pleasant sensation, it might be that you go away or the sensation goes away. Right, if it's you go away, that is you got distracted, then just come on back to the pleasant sensation. You don't need to label the distraction, just you know, relax and back to the pleasant. <clears throat> if that keeps happening over and over and over again, your access concentration wasn't strong enough. Go back to your original object, like the breath, stay longer in access concentration before you switch to the pleasant sensation. If the pleasant sensation goes away, you found it, you're staying with it, and it just fades out. Again, your access concentration wasn't strong enough, and you got no choice but to go back to your access method, the breath, the metta, whatever it was. Stay with it longer before you put your attention on the pleasant sensation. Other problems that can arise if you put your attention on the pleasant sensation, you're staying with it, it's staying there. But nothing's happening. You start commenting. You said something's supposed to happen. It's not happening. Well, remember I said do nothing else. Right? You're commenting on it. It's going to guarantee nothing to happen. <laughs> you have to become a human being instead of a human doing. You just be there enjoying the pleasant sensation. Other problems arise. You try to help it. You don't know how to help it. It doesn't help. It just makes it go away. Or it starts to arise and you get all excited, oh, what's happening? It's happening. <laughs> you know? you got to just observe it. And it increases and it gets sort of stuck and you're just observing and then it a little more. Okay? For some people, when it starts happening, 
it feels like they're going out of control. This is because they're going out of control. <laughs> you can't stay in control and go into the first jhana. You've got to let go into the experience, right? The best I can tell you is that you've never actually been in control of anything in your life. You're just giving up the illusion of control. It's perfectly safe. Right? I mean, the Buddha recommends the jhanas all over the place. You know, he was kind of watching out for his disciples. And I would say that if the first jhana was dangerous, I'd be dead by now. I've been there a lot and it's been very beneficial. But it does feel like you're going out of control. If you can just trust the process and let it happen, fine. Usually what happens is, like, I'm going out of control and you pull out of it. Right? And then on the retreat, you come to me and you tell me about it. And I say, oh, yeah, just keep trying it. And each time you get a little further before you pull out of it until finally you get so far, you can't pull out of it. You find yourself in the first down and it turns out to be perfectly safe. Right? Problem solved. But these are the problems that can come up along the way. Jumping too soon, trying to make something happen, commenting on what's happening or not happening. Right? It, it's, I can still vividly remember the moment the first jhana became mine. I'm on a retreat. I've got good access. I focus on my smile because that's what works for me. Nothing's happening. I, there's a tendency in my mind to reach for it and go, no. <laughs> Just observe. And at that point, the jhana arises, and that's all that's necessary. Just observe. <laughs> but you've got to have a well-concentrated mind because the breath is actually very easy to follow compared to a mildly pleasant, pleasant sensation <clears throat> that's just sitting there doing nothing else. Right? I mean, the breath comes in, it goes out, comes in again. Pleasant sensation just sits there. And so you've got to have good concentration to be able to switch successfully to a very subtle object and stay with that subtle object. But if you can do so and just enjoy the fact that you're totally focused into a pleasant sensation, then this PT and Sukha will arise and take you into the first jhana. So it's got this physical component, this energetic release. Some people will find it runs up their spine. Uh, most people find the muscle tension is there and a big smile. If you get the PT without any sutta, it's pretty miserable. It's just the finger in the light side. But if you get the sutta, the happiness, joy, it's quite a nice experience. As I said, it can get really intense, so intense that it's no longer pleasant. If that should occur, then what you want to do is take a nice deep breath. Remember I said, don't take a deep breath if you're trying to get to the first jhana, take you away from it. If you're in the first jhana and you want to go away from it, take a nice deep breath. When you do, really let out the air on the exhale and focus on the happiness. The exhale will calm the PT. And now you're focused on the happiness, and that will take you towards the second job. Okay. So one last review. Sit in your nice, comfortable, upright posture. It needs to be comfortable, because if it's painful, there will be aversion. If there's aversion, that's a hindrance. It won't work. Put your attention on your meditation object. Come back from the distraction. Label, relax, come back over and over again until you can stay with it. Stay with the object in access concentration for five to 10, 15 minutes. Shift your attention to a pleasant sensation. <clears throat> Do nothing else. The jhana comes and finds you. Question. Is it possible, instead of focusing on a meditation object, is it possible to access the first jhana? something like open awareness? 
it's possible to, fo to focus on open awareness and get into the first shot. I have had, had, I have had students who do that. However, for most people, the open awareness practice doesn't give them the degree of concentration necessary to enter the job. Uh, usually with open awareness, you know, you're noticing this, you're noticing that. Uh, it's, what, what you really need is the one-pointed focus. And you know, open awareness practice, occasionally people find it gives them that. But I would say you're probably going to be better off working with the breath or medicine or body scan or something like that. For those of us who had a very difficult childhood and suffer still from complex PTSD, mm -hmm. entering the jhana is very difficult. And the brain is wired slightly differently, and that the default mode network has a really tight grip. Yes. And so I'm wondering what your advice is to those of us who find ourselves in that. Yeah. So when I teach a retreat, I give two warnings at the very beginning of the retreat. The first is, if you've got any expectations, you're in big trouble. That applies to every retreat. You know, the worst thing you can bring on a retreat is expectations. Because all that you can really expect, it's not going to be like you expect it to be. <laughs> right? Otherwise, they're just going to get in the way. They're going to be wanting. That's one of the hindrances and going to not work for you. The other one is if you have any unresolved psychological issues, they're likely to come up. And working with concentration, yeah, stuff comes up. It is better that it comes up and you deal with it. I've been dealing with it for 50 years. Right. And for people that aren't traumatized such that they're dealing with PTSD for 50 years, then sometimes they can work through it. You know, it comes up, they come have an interview, we talk about it, they deal with it and keep going. For people that have chronic PS PTSD, uh, jhana practice is probably not going to work simply because once you get quiet enough, stuff is going to start showing up. The best thing I can recommend for that is working with trauma therapists, somatic experiences. I've been there, done that. Yeah, that's that seems to be the best thing, and then you can try and see what happens. The stuff will come up. The question is, are you able to set it aside enough to enter the job? There seems to be some correlation between dissociation, which is a major way of dealing with trauma. Yes. And entering into the jhana. Yeah. And that goes back to association seems to be, at least for me, a part of the issue there. Yes. Uh, one of the ways of dealing with PTSD is to disassociate. And entering the jhanas is very similar to disassociating, but it's not the same thing because you are totally present with a very tiny amount of what's going on. Right. And part of what you're present with is not under your control. I mean, you, you've aimed at the pleasant sensation, but what the pleasant sensation does is not under your control. Whereas the association, usually you, you find something you can cling to and just stay with it. So yeah, it's really difficult for people that are dealing with PTSD to get into the job. It's, it's not impossible. It's just a lot more difficult. When I started teaching, the biggest disappointment of all that I found was how many people had terrible childhoods. You know, it was just, it was frightening. Uh, I'm a computer programmer, you know? So it's like, uh, I don't know how to fix those bugs, but that's the biggest failing of Western civilization. Well, except maybe for the climate disaster that's unfolding. Right? But from a psychological standpoint, yeah, it's, it's really a shame. The Western civilization does not do a good job of breaking people. My name is Mrs. Because I wanted to know last night what could you provide a little context about this practice and why we're doing it? Okay. So, why bother with this? <laughs> All right. So the Buddhist teachings can be divided into three 
major categories. Sila, Samadhi, Panya. Ethics or morality, Samadhi, concentration or indistractability, and Panya, inside wisdom. And his basic message is clean up your act, learn to concentrate, use your concentrated mind to investigate what's actually happening. Okay? Normally, when we look at the world, we look at it in terms of, can I eat that, will that eat me? Well, we get a little more sophisticated there. Right? But it's basically, is this something I want to get, or is this something I've got to protect myself from? Or can I just ignore it? And this is how we go through life. I want to get it. I want to protect myself. I can ignore this. Well, despite what it looks like, I am not the center of the universe. Right? It's a lot easier to see what's actually happening if you can look from a less egocentric perspective. Entering these jhanic states <clears throat> uses up all your bandwidth. You don't have any bandwidth left over to generate an ego. Basically, like you told your ego, just sit in the corner. Ta -da. Back to you later. And now when you look at the world, when you start doing your insight practice, your tapasana, you're doing it from a less egocentric perspective with a mind that is very sharp and penetrating and less likely to become distracted. So basically, the reason we're doing these things is because they enhance your insight practice. The first long retreat I did was a one-week retreat followed by a one-month <laughs> retreat with my teacher, Ayakima. And I had learned all eight jhanas by the end of the one-week retreat. I had sat with her before and learned some of them. Picked up the rest of them. So now I had a month to play with them. And I'm having fun playing with them, running them up and down and so forth for a week or so. And then I says, okay, now you got to do inside practice after the jhana. My response was, but it takes me so long. And she just do them faster. <laughs> now, Ayakima was not someone that you argued with. It was, yes, ma'am, I'll, I'll go try that. <laughs> she was a German Jewish terrified nun. Uh, she was your favorite Jewish grandmother, and she was as German as you could be. <laughs> so I, I went off and I did the jhanas, and I started doing my insight practice, and I was completely blown away. In the six years practice before that, the amount of insight I'd gotten to was equivalent to getting behind the wheel of a car and figuring out if you push this lever up, it blinks over here, and push it over down, it blinks over there. And it wasn't a lot. By the end of that month, I had taken the car, backed it out, driven it around the block. You know, I hadn't been on any freeways, but the amount of insight that I got in that month was literally life-changing. Doing the same practices I've been doing for six years. It's just that they're so enhanced that you have a concentrated mind. People get more of this later on. You mentioned uh, a few times that you know, John is getting into the John is a process and it takes a period of time, and a fairly extended period of time. So I think about it in, in one context from kind of from a, a science nature perspective. There's a lot of things in nature, a lot of phenomena in nature that take a period of time. We have things like you know, half-life, time constants, right? So there's something inherent in there that takes a period of time. And in nature, when you when you understand that from a scientific perspective, you can kind of understand oh, that's why it takes so long. Maybe there's other ways to get there faster. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, with the jhanas, it's the mind, probably a lot more complex, but is, is there any kind of scientific perspective on why it's taking that long? And are there ways to uh, speed it up a bit? Yeah. So why it's taking that long is because we are the progeny of creatures that had to pay all the attention to their environment in order to not get eaten. If you fixated on the berries and didn't see the saber-toothed tiger, you didn't reproduce. Right? So evolution has driven our minds to have the default mode network that takes care of us, looks around, checks everything out all the time. So what we're trying to do actually goes against the stream of evolution here. Right? We're trying to find a safe place where we can completely ignore 
the saber-toothed tiger's out there and get very focused. The shortcut is to go on a 10 day or longer retreat, right? Where you've got a lot of time to practice uh, not getting distracted. The way to get to the jhanas is the same way you get to Carnegie Hall. Practice, right? <laughs> so well, what science has told us is that we have to overcome millions of years of programming of checking everything out all the time and feel safe enough that we can learn the skill of locking in enough to set in motion this positive feedback loop of pleasure, and which is what we're doing. When you're focused on that pleasantness, it's kind of nice. It's pleasant to be focused on pleasantness. Well, that adds a little more pleasantness, right? And, and, and adding a little more pleasantness, that's even more pleasantness. And adding, a, right? You see, you're setting up a positive feedback loop. It's like, I got the microphone. I held it up to the speaker, it made that awful noise. What's happening is the ambient noise in the room is going in through the microphone, being piped through the amp, where it comes out louder from the speaker, goes back in again, gets pumped up some more, it makes a horrible noise. We're trying to do the same thing, only with pleasure, that noise. And you're focused on pleasure and enjoying it, which is enjoyable, which adds a little more pleasure, which so the best that I can tell you is, yeah, I've played with this a bunch. I've watched myself get into it. This is scientifically about the best shortcut I can give you for learning the genres, which is to go on a 10 day or longer retreat where they're being taught and play with it. I'll go on a 10 day longer retreat where they're not being taught and I did write a book. <laughs> Good luck. Um, once you learn them and learn them well, then yeah, it's possible. You don't need a different retreat. You just need a daily practice that, yeah, kind of high quality. So you stay in shape. You know, let's say you want to learn, you want to, learn to run a marathon. You got to do a lot of work first, right? And then you run your marathon. We go, wow, I did that. And you go home and you sit on the couch and eat pretzels and watch TV. And then you try to run another marathon, it doesn't work. Then you gotta stay in shape. <laughs> Same thing when you learn the jhanas, you gotta stay in shape by having you know, a reasonably good daily practice. And then the jhanas are fairly accessible, maybe not every sit, but on a fairly regular basis. So, yeah, best I know, set up the optimal conditions, which is a long period of time. Where there's just not that many distractions and play with the instructions until you figure out how to do it. Mark your way in. Okay, this is how I follow the breath. This is what the pleasant sensation feels like. This is what it's like to focus on it. This is how the jhanas arrive. Take that home with you and keep it in your daily practice. Would you say that breath is object? The best place to focus is where you feel the tactile sensation the strongest. And what you're focusing on is the tactile sensations at that location. Yeah, I find that it works best if you can focus on the breath at the nostrils, either just inside or on the area between the nose and the upper lip wherever you feel it, okay? And you just put your attention there. Now, if you're used to following your breath at the belly, that will work. It doesn't work quite as well because it's a grosser movement. The difficulty of following the breath at the nostrils is that it's very subtle. But if you can succeed with the subtle, you've gotten more concentrated, which of course is what you're after in the first place. So wherever you feel the breath the most for the tactile sensations, put your attention there and pay attention to the sensations there. That tends to be good. Yeah, both incoming and outgoing, touching, yeah. off, touching beneath the nostrils. Right, find a place where it's the strongest and you're just always looking to notice what you can there. So you'll notice the end 
probably stronger than the out. Okay. And sometimes when he gets very subtle, you have you have trouble, say, picking up the out, but you still know the in. You just keep your attention at the same location, even if you're not noticing the out. Sometimes it gets so subtle that you can't actually pick up the tactile sensations, but you still know whether it's an in or an out. Keep your attention in the same place, even though you're not picking up the tactile sensations. As long as you know it's in or out, it will still work. But by then you're getting pretty concentrated. So then switch to the question. Um, you talked a little bit about in, the, in that state of absorption state, or So especially coming out of jhana number four, which we will talk about this afternoon, you can get to a place where things are just really quiet. Uh, the mind is still bright, but there's just really not much going on, right? And so then you want to switch to an insight practice. And there are lots of different insight practices. When you're in that state, the particular practice of Choiceless awareness that's taught probably isn't a particularly useful practice because you're so quiet, nothing's going on. There are quite a number of insight practices on my website. Of course, I have a website. It's my first name, last initial, Levy.com. I have a list of insight practices. So click on the Buddha and then look at the little menu that comes up for a list of insight practices. There are some that are more active. Uh, how many people here are, are familiar with the five daily recollections? Yeah. Okay, so not a well known practice, but it's basically remembering that you're subject to old age, sickness, and death. Everything that you find here in the life form is going to change and vanish, and actions have consequences. All right? And so you could contemplate that teaching, uh, just actually start thinking about it. Now, you come out and your mind is so quiet, mm -hmm. the first thing to do is recite the teaching to yourself. So you've got to have memorized. Then it goes, starts off, I am of the nature to grow old. I have not overcome aging. So you just recite that to yourself. Recite the five things. By then, your mind is working a little bit better, and you can pick one of those and just start investigating it. Okay, so one that had the strongest sense, death. Most people don't want to look at death, but it actually turns out to be a very useful thing to investigate. So what's your attitude towards dying? Uh, you, you try and pretend it's not going to happen. I mean, there's lots of ways to investigate. So that's one way to take something that is a teaching and then investigate that teaching. You could take a 10 minute reunion. Of course, you're going to have to memorize the 12 links to start working with that one. It's a valuable thing to do. You know, this is an oral tradition to start off, right? There was a lot of memorization involved. Uh, still a good thing to do. Um, there are practices such as the body scan. I don't know if you're familiar with that practice. Um, Gawenka teaches that. Uh, but it's basically systematically moving your attention over the surface of your body, taking 35, 40 minutes to cover every square inch. That's a particularly good practice to do post jhana. Uh, on my website, if you click on the Buddha and then you find talks, and then you look in there, there's a guided body scan there that you can listen to and to learn that practice. And then after you've listened to it a few times, you can do it on your own. But that's another practice to do. So if if when you come out of a really quiet space, the practice that you're most familiar with just doesn't seem to have any juice, do a different practice. And there are, well, traditionally there are 84,000 Dharma doors. I guess that means it's 84,000 inside practices. Uh, you know, I've probably done 
I probably spent time doing a dozen of them fairly attentively, you know, at various times. So you just find something. The three or four of them you like to do. Whatever. If you go on a retreat with me, I'll, I'll give you six or eight different practices. Do you find any advantage to doing well, at least the three types of um, objects that you mentioned. Uh, the uh, breath, the, the metta. Yeah, you find me like to be able to transfer to insights practice effectively. I guess I'm just kind of curious. Like <coughs> we entered into equanimity jhana versus metta practice versus entering it more from a breath perspective. If there's if you get the jhanas going really well, it matters not at all. It, it doesn't matter at all how you got there. You can get in this room, come through that door, or this window, or the window in the back, right? Once you're in, it doesn't matter really how you got in, right? So it doesn't really matter for entering the jhanas what the access method is. Uh, you get deep enough into the jhanas that the access method is completely forgotten and you know how you got there. No longer matters. So it, it doesn't really matter. Now, what I'm saying is different from what you will hear from other teachers. Okay. Yeah, because, I've heard differently. That's not yeah, the Vasudhi Maga, which is a commentary written uh, eight, eight or nine hundred years after the Buddha in a different culture, right? Uh, you didn't get everything exactly right, at least according to my of both the sutras and the Visuddhi Bhagavad. And some of what it says in there, I don't really agree with. Its description of the jhanas are somewhat different. They are, again, eight altered states of consciousness, but they are far more concentrated. Uh, probably quite useful, but not really particularly available to people who are leading a lay life. They're really practices for full-time meditators, monastics. And, uh, and it turns out a very small subset of those as well. What I'm teaching is accessible to lay people. And what I find is if someone gets into the jhanas as I'm teaching them, hangs out there for a while, then they can come out and see if how they got there has no effect at uh, post for doing it separately. Um, in terms of uh, experience, uh, experiencing and allowing oneself to have that for pleasant, of the experience. I guess a bell goes off somewhere in me and saying that don't get attached. Don't get attached. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so puritanical. And so, you know, like don't get attached to sensual <laughs> sensations, even the Buddha. Right. So I, I, that's one question. And then another quick one. Has, has, I've experienced like the heartbeat as the place to go and being told not to do that. Okay. Could you comment on that? Right. So the heartbeat first. <laughs> there, so a student came to me right before a retreat and says, why can't you use your heartbeat as an object of meditation? I was like, I don't really know. I've certainly had a lot of people say, don't do that. So, yeah. so I started researching it. And what I came up with, all that I could find was that if you use your heartbeat as the object of meditation, either you start messing with your heartbeat and it gets weird and then freaks you out. <laughs> or you don't start messing with it and it still gets weird and it freaks you out. <laughs> so it doesn't seem to be a useful thing. Uh, some of the people were warning against it because observing it will make it change and so forth. Other people warn against it because it changes all the time anyhow and you never knew that and now it starts to worry you. So it seems not to be a valuable thing because it's just a little too weird. Well, one thing I heard about that was that a lot of uh, Buddhist monks that did maybe have that ability could actually, that's how they could actually plan the moment of their death. Mm -hmm. They could literally stop it. Right. I said there were stories of that when many eight or nine died all at once and they couldn't figure out how that happened. So um, maybe yeah. that's also it's a it's a dangerous tool. Right. Know? It doesn't it's it's no one recommends it. It's yeah. highly <laughs> not recommended. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so your earlier question, which of course now I forgot. Oh it's, it's about the attachment to Attach the central. Okay. So and the Buddha talked about Four levels of pleasure. 
and our sensual pleasures, right? And that's everything from sex to burritos to right, sunsets. <laughs> right, so pleasures coming through the senses. The second level is the pleasure of the Brahma Vihara practice, metta, love, compassion, joy. Right? The third level is the pleasure of the jhanas. He said, these are a pleasure I will allow myself. Right? This occurs multiple times in the sutras. And then the fourth level is the pleasure of the fully awakened mind. Full of life. Okay, so that's the four levels. He definitely warned against the sensual desire stuff. But it's more the warning about that. Don't go pursuing that. You will have that. You will experience it. Right? But if you pursue that, you will never find ultimate satisfaction. I mean, think of the most delicious meal that you ever ate in your entire life. So now can you subsist on crappy food? No, of course not. You, you live in San Francisco, you eat really good food. <laughs> right? What are the perks? You know, no meal is ultimately satisfied. Right? Think of the most gorgeous sunset you ever saw. When it was done, did you go, wow, that was so good, I never want to see a sunset ever again? No, of course, we're back the next day to try and see another one. Right? So we, that's what he's warning against. Right? It turns out, though, that in the suttas, multiple places, he talks about the progress of pamoja, piti, tranquility, sukha, concentration. Pamoja is often translated as gladness or worldly joy. Right? And that's what the pleasant sensation is. It's, uh, it's not the, the spiritual joy of sukha, but it's, it's pleasantness. And from that arises piti. From the calming of the piti arises tranquility. And that leads to really deep sukha, which then can take you into deep states of concentration. So, he spoke of Pamoja frequently. So yes, there's a warning about not getting attached to pleasure. There's a warning about not pursuing pleasure, but he does talk about the necessity of actually having pleasure on the spiritual path. It, it occurs in many different suttas. Um, you could probably look it up at lunchtime and quote all, all the suttas where I found that. You know, it, it, a dozen, two dozen, I don't remember how many, that particular thing. But he talks about it's necessary on the spiritual path to have some degree of pleasure, which is quite different from the puritanical stuff that we get presented to us. Now remember, so the Buddha taught, and it's an oral tradition, his disciples remembered what he taught and taught it to the next generation, and this went on for about 350 years before anything got written down. And then it got written down in a culture in Sri Lanka that was different from the culture 300 years earlier where the Buddha lived, right? And it was preserved by celibate monks who had this problem of getting these young guys in. Now, I think probably most of you are aware of what goes on in the minds of teenage boys. Right? Uh, so they got these teenage boys, they've got to deal with their sensual desire. Right? So don't go there. You know, just don't go there. And this worked reasonably well that they got enough monks to keep preserving the Dharma, but they missed out on some of the teachings in doing that. So, yeah, it's a problem because we are told don't go there, but you have to go there with wisdom. You can't pursue it for its own sake. But you have to use it skillfully. Okay. Uh, this one back here I saw earlier. Yes, hi. Um, 
So you mentioned getting the light show. Uh -huh. how, does, how do you manage your attention once that happens? Don't ignore it. Ignore it. Okay, yeah. just go back Full attention on the breathing. Yeah, when I first started meditating, it was like, what am I supposed to look at? <laughs> because I'm very visual and I get the purple blobs. Should I follow the purple purple blobs? Well, no, it turns out don't look at anything. Just give it fully to the tactile sensations of breathing or the feeling of memory. All right, so we're going to go around like this with people who haven't asked questions before. I'm curious what your experience is with your students in digesting the big insights um, relative to doing concentration practices like jhana before they do like a really deep insight practice. Do you see any advantage to that in terms of like the dark night and all of that stuff? Yeah. So there's the progress of insight, which may be your preferred uh, in one of the stages in it is called knowledge of terror. <laughs> it arises once you start getting some of the deepest, more profound insights. The, those insights are insights into anicca, dukkha, anatta, impermanence, inconstancy, uh, unsatisfactoriness, and not self or emptiness. And when you suddenly discover that everything in the world that you were counting on is truly impermanent and you can't count on it, it can freak you out pretty badly. If you're a jhana practitioner, it doesn't freak you out nearly as badly. Ayakima said something like, yeah, knowledge of terror for jhana practitioners is not so bad. It's more knowledge of serious disquietude. <laughs> right? It's like, oh. That's not good, but it doesn't freak you out so much if you get up and run out the door. You know, you go to the teacher, and the teacher may need to work with you some to help you get grounded again from the depth of the insight that you experience. But jhana practitioners have an easier time getting grounded again. I mean, you've already been in eight altered states of consciousness and experienced with all this weird stuff, and here's another weird thing that's even weirder than before, but it buffers the mind. Uh, two questions. So one is uh, regarding the technique when you uh, begin to focus on pleasantness. I'm wondering whether that pleasantness is associated or embodied in a particular location, or if you think of it as the piece, or if you, how, how do you think of it in terms of its location? Yeah. Between... If you can find it embodied in a specific location, like the smile or the heart center or your hands, that's the most useful because you can easily direct your attention to a location. It is possible to enter it with a diffuse sense of pleasure, but the number of people who learn to do the jhanas with a diffuse sense of pleasure is probably 10% versus 90% who find a specific location. But you're not focused, you're not focused on the location, you're aimed at the location, you're focused on enjoying the pleasure. Second question. My second question might be just a probably just a peculiarity of my of the way I've trained myself is um, I when I I'm, I'm accustomed to as emotions uh, arise to observe the sensation that co arises and that sort of got me to when, when I sit down to focus on my breath. Invariably, I'll have things arise, and then I so then I shift to the sensation, kind of feeling like I need to somehow purify or you know get my get myself to a balanced emotional state before I focus on the breath, and therefore I never get to the emotional breath meditation. Right, because it's an endless thing, and I'm and I'm wondering if you uh, so I, I suspect that the answer uh, is just just go to the breath and don't worry about it. I'm wondering if you can. Just go to the breath and don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what you describe is really good insight. Right? But if you want to work with concentration, you're going to have to set everything aside. Right? So you put your attention on the breath, and that thing that that person did comes up and you feel it and worry about it. You put it aside. Right? If it keeps coming up and you can't set it aside, then you may need to turn to it and deal with it some way or another. But the strategy for concentration is that everything is a distraction to be put aside. 
you can come back to it after you're well concentrated and it'll be much more efficient to work with. But you can spend half your time getting concentrated. The other half <coughs> that you spend on insight practice will give you more than twice as much as you spent the whole time. Just like that, three or four times. So yeah, put everything else aside. Uh, what's your explanation Okay, so how would you know that you're in the first jhana? Because you're sitting there calmly following your breath, pretty quiet, you're calmly following the pleasant sensation, which actually you don't have to follow, it's not going anywhere. And then suddenly it gets stronger and stronger, and now you're in a very altered state of consciousness where you've got all this energy in your body and you're smiling like an idiot. <laughs> uh, something changed, <laughs> right? So there are significant enough changes that, uh, yeah, hopefully you're on a retreat and you have a teacher that knows what's going on and you go talk to the teacher and the teacher goes, yeah, 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 or you're really close, you know, you need to, you know, so, but yeah, these are enough altered states that, yeah, you, you get the sense that you're really reason. there. Other people that haven't asked a question. Uh, Hello, thank you. Yeah. So, um, uh, well, I, I know that in um, your teaching, oftentimes there's recommendations to move kind of up and down the ladder for that practice of control. Mm -hmm. right? And then uh, other um, teachers uh, acknowledge that sometimes it's about being in parallel as opposed to in series where there's kind of a peeling away of you're in the first jhana, then there's the second joy, and then there's the third and the fourth, and it's actually that those others have fallen away as opposed to um, being behind you. Yeah. Series versus parallel. Yeah, I would not use series versus parallel. I would use intentional versus unintentional. Mm. Okay, so you can be in a jhana and it moves automatically to the previous jhana or the next jhana. And okay? so you're in one and it automatically moves to two. And then you're hanging out two and it automatically moves to three. And you're hanging out three and it whoops, it just moves back to two. Mm -hmm. So that can happen, but it's still serious. You can't be in two of them at once. Okay. Okay? By definition, I mean, for each of them, there's a strict definition of two fifteen this afternoon. And if you have the, the constituents of the first jhana there, you can't be in any other jhana because the other jhanas say you don't have that anymore. Okay. But yeah, it can move automatically on its own. This is your space of time Q and A. I just want to put this out there in case you don't have Q and A later in the afternoon. Oh, I will. Oh, you will. Okay, so this might be more of an afternoon session, but I'll just put it out there. Um, and you know, see if that's a smaller, but if I'm interested, if you'd like to hear more about the baseline, the health challenge, and what you share with us. Oh, I'll put that out there. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you the details. Hi, um, I, I uh, wasn't aware of Jonathan for any of these days in my practice earlier. Now. But I, um, I just kind of stumbled onto what you're speaking about, you know, concentration, do a Vipassana practice mostly, mm -hmm. and then to discover the, the smile, right? Mm -hmm. And actually, and my hands are a great point of concentration for me. I'm super comfortable with sensation. And in and, and using those, I, I, um, I found myself losing consciousness, so to speak, not passing out, but like actually, I found myself coming to consciousness, like not, not being aware of anything, right. and all of a sudden being like, where, and, and everything was actually black. Yeah. yeah. And, um, so the Buddha talks about the fact that it's necessary to have energy and concentration in balance, mm -hmm. okay? Too much energy and not enough concentration, uh, I think you're probably all aware of that, that's distraction, right? Too much concentration and not enough energy, and you can fall asleep, but you can also go into the state that you described where you're just sort of out of it, right? It sometimes just goes by the name sinking by, Right? You've got a lot of concentration, but you don't have the alertness there. Mm -hmm. And the alertness is due to the fact you don't have the energy level to go with it. If you find yourself in that state, 
like to keep the concentration, so you've got to get your energy level up. Staying in that state is totally useless because, well, you're just not there. You can't gain any insight, and it's yeah, the concentration's great, but it's not got the energy necessary. So pull yourself out of it immediately. Take a few deep breaths, which will sort of back off the concentration a bit. <coughs> Hopefully that gives you a bit more energy and then go back into what you're doing. But you want to go into these states with as much mental energy up as possible and, and then see if you can avoid falling into the not quite asleep, low energy state. It's tricky. I know this state well because I accidentally spent a lot of time fooling with it before I learned that it wasn't useful. And then when I did, I was like, oh yeah, right, okay, I get it. So, and it was possible to, yeah, if I just started going that way, don't go that way. And just keep the energy alert and stuff. All right, anybody else who hasn't asked a question? Um, when you say, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. Uh, I have two questions. One is if you're going to talk a little more, uh, if you could now or later about that actual moment of turning the attention toward the insight versus yeah. experiencing the jhana. And then second, if I have the opposite from the, the film that Red Shirt has, which is not having ease in accessing my emotional body. And if, if that, if you could describe that insight practice, or maybe I need an interview with you for that, that might just be me. But uh, yeah, what, how, how does one go about doing insight practice on emotion? Okay, so in general, to make the transition from the jhanas to the insight practice, when you sit down, decide on the insight practice you want to do. Okay, I'm going to do a body scan. I'm going to do choiceless awareness. I'm going to do whatever. All right, so you sit down and know what to do. Now, get concentrated. Get as concentrated as you can. Fourth jhana, eighth jhana, access concentration, whatever it is. And when it's time to switch to the insight practice, start doing the insight practice. It's just that simple. You don't need to make the jhana go away. It will fade out. It'll be there at first, all right? So you're doing a body scan and you're in fourth jhana, which is quiet stillness. And you put your attention on the top of your head and you start scanning and you stay quiet and still, but you don't notice it anymore because you're just noticing the body sensations as you scan and the jhana fades away. No problem. The whole idea, sharpen your mind, now start using your sharp sword. And for examining your emotions, uh, good to practice off the cushion. Right? The, the best, okay, so I grew up, you know, not really in touch with my emotions. And I got some friends that didn't want to hear any of my intellectual stuff. Oh, he's into his argle bargle again, they would say to me. And they just wanted to know what was going on emotionally with me. And they were so viable. You know, I would hang out with these two women all the time, and they would just pound on me to find out what was going on. <laughs> so find some people that are interested in your emotional state and hang out with them. <laughs> and what comes up might be scary or whatever, but so that was that was how I got there. You could buy with a little help from your friends. <laughs> Can I ask you a follow up to the first question? Uh -huh. I feel like in some of the uh, instruction I've received or ways I've absorbed the teachings in the past, I feel like I there's a confusion for me between practices that are concentration practices and practices that are insight practices. And you're sort of validating that any given practice could actually be either or the other. Is that Many of them. Many of them can be. Um, as I came, we used to say, a little bit of concentration gives you a little bit of insight. A little bit of insight gives you a little bit of concentration. But in particular, breath can be used for both. And the body scan can be used for both. Contemplating the five daily recollections is going to be more insight. But, you know, it might get kind of you know, a little... Uh, a little disturbing, which will sharpen your concentration. Right? So, you know, they, they, 
work. And then there's some like a mantra. If you're doing a mantra, you're not going to get any insight saying the same word over and over and over and over again. But you can't really concentrate it. Right? A visualization like the Tibetans do, uh, you're probably not going to get much insight, but you get really concentrated. Choices awareness, I don't find it particularly concentrated, but you can get some insight. Yeah. So we'll read Barry. Um, I've got a kind of a, maybe it's a novice kind of question, but one thing I'm noticing is that when we talk about turning your attention towards your breath, I find that there's like different ways of, there's different levels of attention. Like I've got this kind of like, what I'm thinking of is kind of like an egoistic kind of focus where I can sort of intentionally focus. But then that way it gets kind of tired and just, and then I'm wondering, like, sometimes I'm noticing that there's a different level of attention yeah. that doesn't get so quite tired. But I'm just curious as to what, you know, what I'm doing here. Right. What you want to do is rest vividly in the breathing. Okay. So it's, it's not forcing your attention to stay there because you get tired. It's not useful. But you're resting your attention there and you're resting very vividly there. In other words, you're looking for the details. Right? So you're, you're really examining everything as closely as you can. But again, not forcing the looking for the details, but just resting there with you as vividly as possible. Okay, no more. People haven't asked. I think two more. One. Um, so I have a question about if you start concentrating on something and you switch to a pleasant sensation, because you kind of know what your pleasant sensation is going to be. You feel it all in. Can you just concentrate on that? And then you don't have to worry about switching. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you can do that well enough, yes. But most people can't. In other words, I know what my pleasant sensation is going to be. I want to get my smile. That's, that's the trigger. Or if I'm going to do meta, I know the feeling of meta. If I generate that much meta, it's, it'll take in. But if I don't have sufficient concentration initially, I can get into the first jhana and fall right out. In other words, I can trigger the PT and Sutra, but I don't have enough concentration to maintain. Or I can get in the first and move to the second and fall right out. So it's often very good to spend a good bit of time doing the very boring breath or whatever to get the concentration level up before you switch to the trigger. The trigger will work very well and take you right in. The problem with going right to the trigger right away is there's a tendency to jump in too soon and not be able to maintain uh, once you get in. It's possible, yeah, to switch to the pleasant sensation and make that the object and stay there long enough to get real concentrated before you trigger the jhana. But the tendency is to trigger the jhana too soon. Uh, so, but you know, all everything I put out is suggestions. This is very much a trial and error process. Actually, it's trial and error and error and error. Can <laughs> <laughs> you finally get it? So if you were on a retreat, I'd say, well, you can try it, you know, go play with it for the next couple of days. And when you come for your next interview, we'll see what happens. All right. And it might work for you. I know for myself, though, if I switch to the pleasant sensation too soon, it's not useful. And if I want really deep jhanas, I should stay in access concentration for a half an hour or an hour and you know, not be back at war before I switch to the pleasant Right, if I start concentrating on my smile, the, the child is going to show up. You know, it's just not going to take that long for it to show up. And when it does, if I don't have the concentration to back it, I'm going to fall out of it. Yeah. Is there any uh, guidance in terms of like how to Willingness, curiosity, patience. Patience is probably the most important thing. Uh, a sense of exploration. Um, yeah, those, those sort of things. Okay. When you when you use language, 
for me, when, when I hear you saying switch, switch to this, I get really busy and, you know, it sort of time to shift gears. And, yeah. And what you're talking about is really very subtle. Yes. And it's actually a kind of a, because um, you're sort of swinging in this unfolding experience moment to moment, and whether that experience tracks body scan or, or if you're, you're, you're noticing and there's a place where intentional focused awareness and awareness of sensation that is but it may be a little present, but it's happening very suddenly and they really are kind of merging together experientially moment to moment. So the sort of discrete shifting yeah. is really subtle. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, it's just a so if you're with the breath, you're Focus is the tactile touch sensation, mm -hmm. not the pleasantness of the touch sensation. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's just the touch itself. The very pleasantness. If it's I'm pleasant, it's pleasant. If it's pleasant already in your heart or your hands, it, you know, you're with the tactile and everything else is there. And now you make the shift and it's, it's simply a shift. So now you're noticing pleasant. It's not like, okay, I got to stop the nose. And let's see. <laughs> It's just, it's a really subtle shift, and you're right. And only now, what you're, you've gone from one pointed focus on that tactile sensation to the one pointed focus on the pleasant. And it's just, you know, you move the telescope just slightly to, to see what you're looking at. Okay, other question, anybody? Can I ask you about the tapper and the arm? This afternoon. So, um, you know, when I think about this practice, in some ways it seems like a preliminary practice to a uh, more enhanced mm -hmm. mindfulness insight practice, and yet it's not that you're introduced um, to, you know, people as they are taking up the practice initially. It's <coughs> often introduced later on down the line as an enhancement to practice. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if it's so conducive to a more enhanced insight practice, um, why is it not more commonly introduced earlier on in the progress of insight? People need to be able to get to access concentration before it's introduced. So to come on a retreat with me, you need to have sat two one week or longer retreats. That's the requirement. Okay, that's the prerequisite. I figure people who have sat two one week or longer retreats have been practicing enough that they probably have the skill to get to access concentration. When I first started meditating, I couldn't follow my breath. You know, that first 10 day retreat it was like, oh my God, here we go again, 45 minutes of boredom, <laughs> you know, and then we're walking and all right, that's okay. Now I've got the 45 minutes of boredom. I didn't have the, the, I didn't have the skill to be able to get to the jhanas. I find the students who learn the jhanas the easiest and do the best are people that have been practicing for maybe two years, been on two, three, four retreats. They haven't learned any bad habits, in other words. <laughs> right? And they come in and, you know, they've got enough skill to actually do quite well. I've had a few students come in and, you know, they just did two retreats and they've been practicing for nine months and they come in and boom, they're right there. So it, it can be introduced like that. But since the jhanas are seldom introduced at all, and there's all this other practice that's given, and the jhanas are sort of skipped. Uh, unfortunately, people wind up doing lots of years of practice before they ever hear the word jhana, and then maybe even longer before they ever try and experience it. Don't get me started on what's wrong with the mm -hmm. teaching of Buddhism in the West. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have enough time, and I'll get myself in really big trouble. <laughs> You talked a little bit about um, having to go on retreat to experience jhanas, jhanas being useful, and like how after you experience all the jhanas, then you want to do insight. Um, I guess I'm curious about the kind of intersection of how useful it is to go on a retreat if your daily practice isn't like 
two or three hours a day, so you're like maintaining that jhana, you know, because like late people don't have that kind of time. Um, Minimum so daily practice, 45 minutes, five days a week. That's the minimum. To maintain the jhana? Uh, to, to maintain the jhanas, jhanas, you'd like to do a little more than that. Okay. But just to be useful for a retreat to be useful to maintain the spell. If you're coming on a retreat to learn the jhanas, you want to do an hour a day, six and a half days a week. Right? So pretty much, you know, every day. Right? Uh, and then you'll be set for learning the jhana. When you go home, you can probably go back to your 45 minutes, five days a week. And it, it's going to depend on how well you know them and how good your daily practice is. Some people can get by with, you know, 45 minutes, five days a week. Uh, I find for myself, I come back from a retreat and my access in my daily practice starts to fade out. I don't hit it all the time. Uh, I came up, my teacher said that you need an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening every day. Now that's what she told me, not what I managed to do. But I find if I get a second sit a day, the jhanas are there almost every time. In other words, that first sit, I'm taking out the garbage. And the second sit, okay, there's enough garbage out of the way I get into the jhanas. Uh, but, you know, I found I could maintain them fairly reasonably well. Uh, the daily practice, you know, and not worry if I had a dental appointment and I didn't sit today or whatever. And then uh, sitting in the evening with the group a couple times a week. But I could, especially with the group, I could access the job. And yeah, I never did two or three hours of practice. No. Just a quick question, because I think you mentioned this in your book too. Um, outside of Theravada Buddhism, there's a term called Kundalini. Mm -hmm. Do you equate them as similar? And it just seems like there's all these other kinds of traditions that, where that's kind of their goal or their aim. Yeah, the PD energy I talked about in other traditions, it goes by the name of Kundalini energy. It's used a bit differently. Okay, you're supposed to play with it some more. I, I, I don't really know. I haven't done Kundalini Yoga, so I don't know. But it's the same energy. And talking with students who have done Kundalini Yoga and who are skilled at the first jhana, they're like, yeah, yeah, this is what we did in Kundalini Yoga. So it's the same energy. There's also the Tibetan Tumo practice, the mystic heat. Again, it's the same energy. Uh, I talked with a student who was practicing the jhanas and who had done Humo practice, and he's like, yeah, it's the same energy. <laughs> Except that the PT energy, which often shows up for most people as sort of vibration, that up straight, muscles get tense, can also show up as heat. And Tumo practice is to use that energy and make it manifest as heat, which is a valuable thing to do in the winter. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Something I read in your book about the world's people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll talk about that this afternoon. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've entered the jhanas through um, contemplating the world. And I just thought that was such a strange definition. Yeah. And I wonder if you could talk about that. I was shocked. I was surprised. It wasn't my plan yeah. for that to happen. It just happened. And I thought it was such a strange and interesting thing. Uh, it's talked about in the Vasudhimaga. One of the practices that can lead to jhana is contemplating a corpse. Right? So, uh, in doing so, it's going to really focus you. Right? Okay, it's like, uh, it's the great matter of life and death, as they say in Zen tradition. Right? And suddenly the great matter of life and death is right in your face. And so it can concentrate your mind quite strongly. Uh, strong enough so that if there is a flicker of pleasure that happens to come through, it blasts you right into the jhana. You're not going to get the flicker of pleasure from the corpse itself. You're actually going to get it from some instability in your concentration practice. And that's okay because it will take you into the jhana. How um, often does the um Using this practice in our daily life, do you find that this level of deepening our concentration has value? Like, have you noticed differences in your work? Um, you know, abilities. Yeah. I mean, just at, in the application of the cushion. Right. That's the question I have. Yeah. 
I was always pretty good at concentration. I think that was a gift I got for one day. And I worked as a computer programmer, which is a you know real concentration exercise. Did it enhance my programming? I don't know, because I didn't have a, a, a twin that didn't concentrate the control. <laughs> you know? But I was quite good at my job. Uh, and I took a, a concentration test online, which I can't find anymore, I wish I could. And uh, <clears throat> there were a hundred items that you had to be concentrated enough to either click or not click when they flash something on the screen. I got 97 of them right. Mm -hmm. So my concentration level is quite good. And I'm sure that it did enhance my programming ability. And, and I wrote a book, you know, I hate writing, but I used to do it. <laughs> so. Enjoyment? I mean, I'm just thinking about the application because if you're experiencing pleasure, Genre that you would be able to transfer that data computation in your work with your work like to, to see the benefits of that. I don't know that the pleasure transfer. Okay, so this is the three types the greedy type, the aversive type, and the deluded type. I'm a greedy type. I've been, I've been playing with pleasure a long time. I remember sucking my thumb, it was all about pleasure. <laughs> All right, so uh, I could do the pleasure <laughs> thing already. That, that wasn't a problem. Um, but the concentration skill, you know, yeah, that enhanced. And yeah, the, the ability to concentrate in pleasurable situations certainly was enhanced. Um, the Greek types find it easiest to learn the genres because they're familiar with pleasure. And I say focus on pleasure, and they're like, yeah, I'll do that. The aversive types benefit the most from learning the genres because they finally get a chance to play with pleasure in a way that they never usually play with it. And deluded types either find the genres very easy or very difficult. And these are generalizations, but that's sort of what I've found over the years. And so for an aversive type, the genres, the fact that they're experiencing pleasure like this in a way that they don't usually do, can be very useful. Uh, but since I didn't have problems experiencing pleasure before, it didn't really enhance my ability to experience pleasure. But it definitely enhanced my ability to concentrate. Concentrating in pleasurable situations, yeah, enhances it. I think um, that, um, is there any like, downfall of practicing of concentration? Is, for example, I had the experience occasionally when I come back from a retreat and my mind's concentrated, that the emotion that I have, good or bad, it's it's amplified. Mm -hmm. Like when I get angry, I get really, really angry. Right. Yeah. Uh, concentration, right? So it's one pointed. It allows you to really put all of your energy into one thing. Right? So you come back, back from a retreat and you have this capacity to put all of your energy into one thing. And if the one thing is being angry, yeah, you're, you're getting fully there. And you're not <clears throat> so perhaps given to suppressing what's going on. You're right there fully with it. Do I find that to be a disadvantage? No. I actually find that what I need to do is explore what it's like to be angry. Why am I getting angry? What, is, what are the triggers about this? In other words, yeah, it's more in my face what I've got to deal with. The other thing I would say, when you come back from a retreat, you are quite sensitive. And you can easy, more easily be triggered to go quite angry. Because, let's face it, it's crazy out there. <laughs> Have you noticed? <laughs> <laughs> As you come, you go to a retreat and you're in a very sane environment. There's not much going on. There's good food and hopefully people telling you some interesting, useful things. And you come back here and it's awful. I came back from a month long retreat and <clears throat> I had had surgery on my shoulder 
and was on disability on the nights. He would go treat for a month while I'm on disability and uh, come back, see the doctor. And it's like, yeah, okay, uh, maybe we can start back to work part time. So we worked out what I was going to do. And I go back and I tell the HR person. And uh, she says, oh, yeah, um, the insurance company called and this is your schedule. And it was not what I, my doctor and I had worked out. And I exploded. And the poor HR lady, <laughs> she was just reporting what the insurance company said. I had to buy her a pen. <laughs> but I was so sensitive there that, you know, I just totally reacted to the insurance company in a totally inappropriate way. You know, because that's what happens when you come back to a retreat. You're, you're blasted with all the insanity of the current culture. Side note, the insurance company wasn't paying my bills. I had to pay the bills and sue them. And they still wanted to run my company. Yeah. Um, can you just clarify what you said earlier? Okay. Um, my, so a lot of times, probably I'll just ask this question to begin with. I don't know a lot of times you might hear they develop you know, a certain amount of concentration after a certain point, you know, then turn to uh, these other factors. I think I might have heard you say just develop whatever degree of concentration you can, whether that's small, medium, large, for lack of a better word, it. And, yeah. and then you can practice turning the inside practice to wherever you are. Is that? Yeah. I said get as much concentration as you can. Yeah. If you can get to the jhanas, get that. If you can't get to the jhanas, and I'm assuming most of you are probably not jhana practitioners, few of you I know are. But get as much as you can and then turn the inside. And if as much as you can get is access concentration, get that. And if it's third jhana, get that. If it's seventh jhana, get that. And then turn the inside practice. Yeah. Great, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, the other thing is, um, oh yeah, I think that you said, so if you can't kind of go up and down your access concentration for just a long, long, long um, line, I think you're saying that noticeably you want to go deeper, even though you could move from access concentration to a different level, that you had to stay and like dwell in kind of a lower level of concentration even longer. Does that help rather than okay? Yeah. yeah, so it seems like the amount of time you spend at access concentration is a determinant of how deep the jhanas are you're going to experience. The jhanas are multipliers. And what gets multiplied is the depth of your access concentration. So if you get an access concentration level of one, and the first jhana doubles it, and you get to two. You get an access concentration level of eight, and you go to the first jhana, and then you get to 16. Right? So the deeper the access concentration, once you enter the jhanas, the deeper the jhanas are going to be, and they will multiply what you bring to them. Okay? It is possible to get into the jhanas and spend a good bit of time there and get deeper, but it seems for me personally, and in talking with other people, it's better to spend more time on the front end getting a really good access concentration and then trigger the jhanas and multiply that and to jump in soon and try and build up through the jhanas. Basic question, and I often get confused here. Uh, when you focus on the breath, is it to start with being mindful and noting the breath and then staying the same with the breath? For example, uh, it's the in-breath, now it's the out-breath that, that is my uh, upper hip area. Is it to best start with noting and then staying with the breath? Is it mindfulness and concentration together? How, how is the process? Yeah, the ideal is to wind up just simply noticing the tactile sensations. But often when we start out, we've got so much distraction, we need some aids. And actually, in my book, I give five different aids that are possible. One of them is counting. I suggest you count the gap between the out and the in. So you breathe in, you breathe out, one. Breathe in, breathe out. Two. You only go to eight. If you get to eight, you start at one. If you get lost, you start at one. No prizes for getting to eight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Okay, so that's a really good way to help you get settled. You have to drop that and just be with the breathing. You could do with a, a, a label like in, out, in, out. Personally, I don't find that works quite as well as the counting. The counting is the one I, I find works the best. Uh, you could use boo, do, if you wanted something other than in, out, peace, love. Uh, Another one is to look at the parts of the breath. Can you notice the beginning of the in-breath, middle of the in-breath, end of the in-breath, gap, beginning of the out-breath, middle of the out-breath, end of the out-breath, gap. Not, not note them, notice them, identify those parts. If you try to label it, it goes way too fast. <laughs> so those are things you can try. But the idea with any of these aids is you drop it and now you're just with the tactile sensations only. And when you can stay with that without getting distracted, then you're that. All right. The last two questions, which is time for lunch. I want to ask you if you have any suggestions uh, for the uh, difficulty of maintaining one's awareness of the tactile sensations of the breath versus the fall. Having tactile sensations. Yeah. So it's a very, very tricky little thing that I find myself irritating from what I think are having the actual feeling, the actual tactile yeah. sensation, into it's just a thought. Right. Yeah, it, it is tricky. And when you find you're in the thought, just look a little more carefully and see, okay, can I actually feel the tactile sensation? And so it's like you're on the tactile sensation, now you're on the thought, now just come back to the tactile sensation. But don't make a big deal about it. It's just, it's just like, no, look a little more carefully. It's, it's, it's just a little bit of a push to look more carefully at the tactile sensation. But I know exactly what you're talking about, and I find myself all the time doing the same thing. And it's like, no. Actually, notice the last one before. I noticed in my practice that um, I, I really love the, I really enjoy the present, and I really do a damn good job of keeping away from the uncomfortable and painful. And if the sweet and the calm um, of the asana actually does a good job at what I've come to see with. In some ways, quite a big bypass of the emotional stuff. Stuff that I can avoid yeah. and distract from. And um, listening to talking, I, um, I, I can see how that can could be for me actually. A bit of habits I can watch for that can be very seductive, can be very nice. And uh, you know, the bypass of the discomfort. Yeah, you don't need discomfort. If you don't need to get upset if it's slightly discomfort. Right? You don't need to go searching for perfect pleasure. Uh, you know, just get get comfortable enough that your body is in a position that you can leave it in for the length of the sitting without having to move. That's the idea. And it's going to be slightly uncomfortable after a while, but you know, just hopefully <laughs> concentrate it enough. It's not a big deal. But yeah, if you go always looking to have it pleasurable, you know, it's never, it's never going to be good enough. Okay. One last one because we have two minutes. Yeah. I don't know if you switched this already, but I, I also sometimes when I get lost, long ways, rest in the power of the song. You know? Yeah, that can be helpful. There's, there's lots of things that can be helpful yeah. along the way. But yeah, the fact that you guys have this group is fantastic. I, I mean, I'm very impressed and really appreciate it. Um, so yeah. All right. So it's almost 12:30. Uh, I suspect there's something unique in this neighborhood, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you brought something unique. <coughs> How long do we want for lunch? But I do have something to say. What? Well, if people are going to go eat somewhere, then we probably need an hour. That's right. the reality. Yeah. Yeah. But the reality is, what hour? If you come back early, you can sit because we're going to sit for half an hour starting at 1.30. So you just come back in quietly and start meditating.
come back before 1.30. And also, we have some tables which we can set out and obviously we have chairs. So if anyone did bring food or wants to bring food back, you're welcome to assist in the community. Do you have any suggestions for the yeah, it's, it's, this is, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. There, there's, this place is incredible. Yeah. All right, so I'll see everybody at 1.30 for a half hour shift. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. Right. That's one of the things too. Put some down my finger. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we'll eat lunch and then after lunch we can go Well, I don't know if we'll have time after lunch, but four o'clock when this ends, I have no place else to go. I can wait. I wait to dinner at five p.m. Oh, great. Yeah, so we can go. So where is Right now, the Right? Yes. Fine. Right. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Enjoy your lunch. All right. Yeah. So, but out there. Yeah. Do you need directions? Well, I presume you go to 24th yeah, Street and it's almost right there. I mean, there's there's areas, but there's other places as well if you want particular. I want something to like. You uh, mean Thai food? Yeah. Chili cha cha. Turn right. Chili cha cha on your right. Two blocks up. I think I should, someone should stay. So yeah. Alan's going to stay. Alan's going to stay? Uh, I know, right? Yeah. Like, there's not enough time to. Yeah. Okay. Yes. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 
so much. Yeah, yeah. Take it out of here. I'll see yeah. you Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is this connected to uh, it's connected to the internet to a, a specific website or? I really don't know. Oh, okay, I thought you had set it up. I don't know. Um, so I'm technically volunteering, but I know very little. <laughs> <laughs> I can think of some of their. Um, I think I think you know if they would do this, but some of their um, Dharma talks they put on YouTube, I believe. So I Maybe don't know. Just, just yeah, just sure. a collective. So I would guess that's. You might ask the people who are. Sitting yeah. at the desk, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't know it was like live streaming. So yeah. People who might have like signed up and couldn't physically see That's what I was wondering. Yeah. I feel the cast, but I I have no inside knowledge. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that was a lot of it. Okay. So I think that's beautiful. I mean, I mean, he's such a well known person. I'm sure a lot of people would have. Oh, he's great. It's a real treat. Yeah. Yeah, I'm someone of that caliber here.
done. I'm no longer a classroom teacher. I was for a long time, but now I work in a sensory thing for a lot of people who have to learn it. But Like you couldn't do calculus 
Right. Our evil. Evil Right. Our evil. Evil Right. Ice 
this thing. Mm. And maybe there has been an ice crystal baked throughout the night out. I have a feeling that it would really have No, no, no. We don't eat 
church in this Christopher Meese land. This is our last year Well, yes, please. <laughs> well, you ask him. No, no, no. You're the one who right for it. You I know what the question is. I mean, I have another question actually for him about the story. I don't want to ask him a question. I don't want to like, yeah. get through all of this material. I feel like you sort of put on the schedule already. Right? Well, but did you ask any question this morning? No. But I have one question that I can serve for later on. Yeah, I'll tell you what it is. So if you, if you watch that YouTube video or a technical in one of these games, would you like to would you like to see it for you to see your stream that you will walk to the audience? Well, it's a very weird video for me, so because they're like doing this travel on that that's kind of interesting. Yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question. Well, that wasn't a question. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, at one point, because both of my crew left the questions, just zero on an issue or five. It's understandable. Um, so most likely to have a library like right. and, and, and a channel. Yeah, it'll have to be you know, a library that they've approved. But I can't see why they wouldn't. And then we'll so we're working right. now or talk to the designers on the form to have a like in other words, is there a is there one cost about teachers? you never know. <laughs> Everything does, yeah. Can I move this closer? It's just the sound isn't so good. Okay. Well, maybe that'll help. Can we have a question? Yeah. I have a question too. Can you sit in that chair for me for a second? I'm just modeling. <laughs> um, 
Um, there we go. That'll work. Thank you. Okay, you're afraid to get I have a question for you. So this video that you're making, will it be available to watch later? Uh, yes, hopefully it will. Quality works out. It'll be on our YouTube, on SFDC's YouTube channel. We can't live stream because we don't have enough followers yet, but we're, you know, yeah, but we'll see. That's really good news because when I asked a few weeks ago, it would be here, no, probably not, but you'd like to donate some recording equipment to you. Yes, I yeah, we're see. still working on that. Um, yeah, we're trying to get to the point where we've got better equipment so that we can get more out there. But this is really good because my, some of my Buddhist friends in Southern California couldn't make it up here for this live. I told them I will try to get it like available That's so that you can like towards. watch it. So yeah. since you're doing your media image here, yeah, maybe there's some hope they'll get to. Right, see it. we are very much hoping that these two, if we can get the sound quality up, and even perhaps it with problematic sound. Okay. Oh yeah.
Well, I was thinking of sending you all out to do walking meditation, but I'm assuming you're going to have as many questions after the next talk as the previous. So rather than doing that, let's take a look at the first four jhanas. So the jhanas appear frequently in the suttas. Uh, they're in half of the long discourses. They're in a third of the middle length discourses. And the connected discourses is a whole section on the jhanas, plus they're all over the place. They show up in the numerical discourses. Uh, clearly they were a very important part of the Buddha's teaching. But everywhere they show up, it's almost exactly identical. Occasionally you'll find something that has a little bit of extra thrown in, but mostly it's exactly the same thing. The same stock phrase. This makes sense, it was an oral tradition. And so you're learning a sutta and you get to the jhana part and you say the jhana thing. You learn a new sutta and you get to the jhana part and you say the same jhana thing. So whatever the Buddha said, it all coalesced into this, well, they call it a pericope, Scott, uh, a, a, a stock phrase. <clears throat> so, quite secluded from sense pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, one enters and dwells in the first jhana. Secluded from sense desire, secluded from unwholesome states is the abandoning of the five hindrances. Wanting, not wanting, too much energy, too little energy, doubt. Usually it's given as sensual desire, ill will and hatred, sloth and torpor, resistance and remorse, skeptical doubt. All right? The method we're using to abandon the hindrances is generating access concentration. If you're at access concentration, you're not getting distracted. If you're not getting distracted, you're not falling into any of the hindrances. Okay? So get to access concentration, and then one enters and dwells in the first jhana, which is accompanied by vitaka and vichara. Okay, those words have been, well, discussed a lot. Vitaka means thinking, and vichara means something like turning things over, wandering around, taking a look at, or examining, or pondering. Unfortunately, in the Vasudhimaga, which as I mentioned was about 800 years after the Buddha's death, they had changed what they understood the jhanas to be to such an extent that the words thinking and examining no longer fit. So rather than go, oh, I think we made a mistake, we're describing something that doesn't fit the description, they went, Let's just change the description. Let's give these words different meanings. <clears throat> and so by the time of the commentary, you find vitaka meaning initial attention and vichara meaning sustained attention. But that's never what it meant to the Buddha. In fact, vichara means, literally means wandering around. Wandering around doesn't sound like sustained anything, right? But because of, well, all right, so, the Buddhist disciples learned the jhanas, and then they taught them to the next generation. And eventually you got a bunch of guys out in the woods, no TV, no women, nothing to do but meditate, right? And whoever could do it the longest and strongest, that was the real thing, right? And they just kept discovering deeper and deeper states. You can actually see this happening just a bit in some of the later suttas. And then a good bit more in the Abhidhamma, which begins to be composed about 200 years after the Buddha's death. And then we, by the time we get to the commentaries, 800 years after the Buddha's death, there are eight completely different states that are quite different from what's described in the suttas. And the words Vitaka and Vichara don't mean there what they mean to the Buddha. But one, I think the Buddha knew what he was talking about, if anybody did. And two, 
what's described in the Vasudhi Bhagavad is only suitable for full-time monastics, and I don't see anybody who looks like that in this room. So uh, I'm going to go with what the Buddha said. So secluded from sense pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, one enters and remains in the first jhana, which is with that background thinking that was there in access concentration, and is filled with rapture and happiness born of seclusion, piti and sukha. Piti, the physical component, sukha, the emotional component. One drinks deep, saturates and suffuses one's body with this rapture and happiness born of seclusion, so there is no part of one's entire body not suffused by this rapture and happiness. This is an advanced practice. The first thing to do is to get into the first jhana the first time. And then the next thing to do is to get into the first jhana the second time, right? Which sometimes can be a little more difficult because you want it again, right? And then get in regularly and get in and now sustain it for five to 10 minutes. Right, so get regular at getting in and sustaining. And when you can do that, then you can try and move the PT Sukha feeling throughout your body. Most people find the PT arises sort of upper torso, neck and head, maybe your entire spine or something, but definitely the upper part of the body. And uh, the, sukha, uh, the Sukha is just, yeah, sort of in your face area. And so you want to drench deep, saturate, and suffuse your body. So put your attention where you feel the PT Sukha experience the strongest, and then move your attention to some other part of your body where you don't feel it. And it'll just follow right along. And then you move it to another part, lower through your abdomen, down one leg and down the other. And over a period of three or four minutes, you can get the feeling to be all encompassing. But it's an advanced practice. First, you got to get in, then you got to get stable. And then you can play with this. We have a simile. Suppose a skilled bath attendant or a apprentice were to pour soap flakes into a metal basin, sprinkle them with water, and knead them into a ball of soap powder, of soap flakes that would be pervaded by moisture, encompassed by moisture, suffused with moisture inside and out, and yet would not trickle. So we get a picture of soap at the time of the Buddha. You didn't go to the Safeway and buy a bar of soup. You got a bowl, you poured in soap flakes, you poured in water, and you mix the two. This frenetic mixing is very reminiscent of what the PT is like in the first jhana. It's a very busy experience, right? And then you have your ball of soap. And the water pervading the soap flakes is like the PT sukha pervading your body. In the first jhana, you may not be able to tell the difference as this is PT and this is sukha. It's more of a PT sukha experience, but that doesn't really matter. You know, it's just this wow, different state. In the same way, one drinks a steep, saturates, and suffuses one's body with the rapture and happiness born of seclusion, so there is no part of one's entire body not suffused by this rapture and happiness. Okay. So five to 10 minutes is probably sufficient for the first jhana. Beyond 10 minutes, mm, probably not a good idea. Running all that energy, uh, it, oh, it does have a cost. It could leave you kind of jangly. It could leave you with insomnia. People who stumble into the first jhana, say in the sitting before going to bed, uh, they don't sleep well that night because it'll wire you up. And yeah, 10 minutes of running that energy is enough. But if the energy is really strong, which is what a lot of people find, 10 minutes is way too much. Maybe only a couple of minutes. If it's really strong, maybe only 20 or 30 seconds, right? When you've been in it five to 10 minutes or you've had enough because it's so intense, then the thing to do is to take a deep breath, right? Remember I said, don't take a breath if you want the first jhana. Take the deep breath. And in doing so, if this is the PD and this is the sukha, then what you're doing, you take the breath and you do a foreground background shift. Everything calms down, but the PD calms down much more. And now the sukha is much more prominent, the emotional state. Focus on the emotional state of joy or happiness. And this will take you towards the second jhana. 
Further, with the subsiding of thinking and examining, one enters and dwells in the second jhana, which is accompanied by inner tranquility and unification of mind. The inner tranquility arises from turning down the volume on the PT. When you're the first jhana, tranquil doesn't, yeah, it does not apply. It's, it's gangly. So you take the breath and it calms down. Now you have the inner tranquility. And the trick to make it the second jhana is to gain the unification of mind. Let your mind become totally unified with experiencing the emotional state of joy, happiness, the sutra. And so you're one point of the locked in and your focus is no longer anything physical, it's emotional. It's the feeling of joy or happiness. The <coughs> intensity level of the sukha varies from person to person. If you get good at it, then the happiness could be like, um, well, it's your birthday. And somebody gives you a present and you're like, oh, wow, this is so cool. I always wanted one of these. Yeah, yeah that kind of happiness. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not due to any outside influence. You're doing this just strictly with your own mind. You are putting yourself intentionally into a place where you feel happy for no other reason than you got concentrated. So the subsiding of thinking and examining, so that background thinking drops away. It would be great if it drops out completely. Most people on a 10 day retreat, it never, doesn't drop out completely. It just gets much quieter more gaps between the thoughts. So you're kind of wobbling a bit. I mean, it, ideally, you're rock solid, there's no thoughts, and it just happens. But yeah, probably going to be a little wobbling. There's going to be a little background PT. The energy's not going to completely disperse, but it's probably going to make you rock, sway, something like that. Uh, rather than jangle. And you're in the second jhana, which is uh, without thinking and examining and filled with rapture and happiness born of concentration. So the rapture and happiness of the first is said to be born of seclusion, born of secluded from the hindrances or born of access concentration. And now it's from the concentration of the first jhana. So you have a higher quality sukha and a more smooth um, PT. One drink of steep saturates and suffuses one's body with the rapture and happiness born of concentration. So there is no part of one's entire body not suffused by this rapture and happiness. Okay, so each of the first four jhanas seems like they're going physically down. So if the first jhana was in your face, the second one seems to be centered more in the heart center, right? So things have dropped down a bit. And it's, well, it's like the heart center is where it's the strongest. So you put your attention there and then you just move your attention to your arms if there's no happiness down your arms and it will follow right along with you and then down through the rest of your body. But again, an advanced practice. First, you gotta get in. And then you got to get in and sustain it. Now, this is a little more difficult to sustain because your object of attention is an emotion, which is very different from the breath or body scan or something like that. It's just a pure emotion. It's just sitting there. Maybe it's a little stronger, a little weaker. You know, it's not rock steady, but it, you know, it's not doing much. So a little harder to maintain. And for the second and higher, you could probably maintain these for as long as you wanted with no problem. Um, 10 to 15 minutes is good. Uh, well, I, you know, you could do half an hour, hour if you wanted to. Probably better to do 10 or 15 minutes and move on. But, uh, you can spend a while. We have another simile. Suppose there were a deep lake whose water is welled up from below would have no inlet for water from the east, west, north, or south, nor would it be refilled from time to time with showers of rain. And yet a current of cool water welling up from within the lake would drink steep, saturate, and suffuse the whole lake, 
So there would be no part of that entire lake which is not suffused with the cool water. So the picture, a lake up in the mountains, no streams, no rain, but a spring. And the spring water completely permeates the lake, filling all parts of it. Right? It's the same with uh, sukha, the happy feeling of the second jhana. It just completely fills your body if you spread it. In the same way, one drinks is deep, saturates, and suffuses one's body with the rapture and happiness, born of concentration, so there is no part of one's entire body not suffused by this rapture and happiness. I hadn't heard this simile when I first learned the second jhana, and I'd been practicing it for a little over a year before I heard the simile. Now he came and gives it in a Dharma talk. And after she leaves, I go running after her. I came, I came, it's just like that, it's just like that. <laughs> this really captures the feeling of the second jhana. This is wellspring of happiness just coming out of your heart center. It's just bubbling up and you're just happy for no reason. First jhana, you got a big grin, teeth showing. Second jhana, you got a big grin, no teeth. And you're just <laughs> happy. Further, with the fading away of rapture, one dwells in equanimity, mindful and clearly comprehending, and experiences happiness with the body. Thus one enters and dwells in the third jhana, of which the noble ones declare, one dwells happily with equanimity and mindfulness. So the transition to the third jhana is when the piti disappears. So PT predominates in the first with Sukha in the background. You go to the second, Sukha predominates, PT in the background. And the third jhana, the PT is gone and there's just Sukha. But the Sukha actually is more transformed into contentment, wishlessness, satisfaction. Satisfaction so complete that if Mick Jagger had been practicing the third jhana, he wouldn't be able to sing that song. <laughs> right? You're just satisfied. When drinks steep, saturates and suffuses one's body with the happiness free from rapture, so there is no part of one's entire body which is not suffused by this happiness. Now, for some people, the PT just fades out in the second jhana and they find themselves in the place that's very still. And the happiness has gotten a little calmer, more contented feeling rather than joyous feeling. And they just slide into it. But you can go there intentionally. Again, it might be helpful to take a breath. And as you do, just really relax and turn down the volume on the happiness towards contentment. Just let the happiness, you know, sort of drift down towards contentment. It's a fairly easy thing to do. It may be helpful to remember a time when you were very contented. Say you had just eaten the perfect meal, you didn't overeat, you don't have to wash the dishes, right? Mm -hmm. A quarter second memory, right? And you pluck the feeling of contentment out of that, right? So got the happiness, turn the volume down, there's the memory, there's the feeling of contentment, and now you're focused on the contentment. And then, when you get skilled at it, again, you can do the same trick of moving your attention throughout your body. It's going to seem physically lower than the second jhana, maybe at the belly. Okay. Things are getting quieter and more still. Without the peaky there, there's no sense of movement at all. It's just content. And that's it. Suppose in the lotus pond there were blue, white, or red lotuses that had been born in the water, grow in the water, never rise up above the water, but flourish immersed in the water. From their tips to their roots, they would be drenched deep, saturated, and suffused with water, so there would be no part of those lotuses not suffused with water. In the same way, one drenches deep, saturates, and suffuses one's body with a happiness free from rapture, so there is no part of one's entire body which is not suffused by this happiness. So the picture is a lotus pond with lotuses coming up out of the mud, but not above the surface of the water. They're not waving in the breeze, they're not bobbing up and down. They're just very still underwater. And they're isolated. 
right? This is the sense you're beginning to get in the third jhana. It's very still and it's somewhat isolated from the world around you. You're not quite as engaged as you were. You've really gotten deeper inside. Again, this is one that you could spend as long as you wanted in. 10, 15 minutes is what I recommend. Get skilled at it before you try to learn the next one. But if you wanted to spend a half hour, an hour there, it would be no problems. Uh, except you might run out of the neurotransmitters, whatever they are, that make the jhana, and then you can just slide off into the next one. This is the case for all of them. So, the fourth jhana. Further, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous passing away of joy and grief, one enters and dwells in the fourth jhana, which is neither pleasant nor painful and contains mindfulness fully purified by equanimity. All right, so the first three jhanas are all pleasant, right? You got rapture and happiness, happiness and rapture, and contentment, and all of those are pleasant states. Right now, to move to the fourth jhana, you've got to let go of the pleasure. You don't want to go negative, so what you want to do is go into an emotionally neutral state. I find that the transition is fairly easy. In the third jhana, I've just got a wispy Buddha smile, right? All I have to do is put my attention on the muscles in my face and relax them. And the smile drops away, and there's a sense of dropping down. And I just go with that dropping down and ride it down to a place of quiet stillness. Fourth jhana is usually called the jhana of equanimity. But if I tell you, focus on equanimity, uh, that's a little nebulous. <laughs> what do you want to focus on? But if I tell you, focus on quiet stillness, and you succeed, you will be focused on equanimity. Right? So that's what you're looking for. The transition does feel like it drops much further down. So first jhana hit, second jhana heart, third jhana belly, fourth jhana below the floor. Right. Again, it might be helpful to take a deep breath and as you let it out, relax all the muscles in your face and see if there's a sense of dropping down and just ride the dropping down to quiet stillness. Ayakima said that it might be helpful to think of being in the third jhana as in the mouth of a well, a bit isolated from the world around you. The fourth jhana, let go and drop down the well. Now the dropping isn't free fall. It's sort of drifting down. Okay? It's more like drifting to the bottom of the swimming pool. Right? It just, just goes down, 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 and then eventually it settles. And where it settles, you want quiet stillness. Another image that might be helpful, you're sitting in the mouth of a cave in the third jhana. In the fourth jhana, go deep, deep inside the mouth, and the cave goes down as well. Right? Or drifting down to the bottom of the swimming pool. So let go into this sense of things going down and notice that you're emotional state has become completely neutral and you focus on quiet stillness. And when it settles, you've arrived at the fourth job. It says, it says he sits suffusing his body with a pure bright mind. So there is no part of one's entire body not suffused by a pure bright mind. When I first heard that, I was a little puzzled. Because pure, yeah, when your mind is that calm and quiet, it's really pure. But bright? I didn't get the bright because it was dark. I mean, you close your eyes, it's dark. And that's all I saw was blackness. And it was like, what's that about? Why does it say bright? There's a similar one. Suppose a man were to be sitting covered from the head down by a white cloth, so there would be no part of his entire body not suffused by the white cloth. In the same way, one sits suffusing one's body with a pure, bright mind, so there is no part of one's entire body not suffused by a pure, bright mind. The picture is pretty clear. There's a guy sitting with a white sheet completely covering him. Right? I, I could see the covering be the isolation from the world around you because you're really quite withdrawn at this point. 
well, why a white sheet? So I went, to, I came and I asked her about it. And she said, well, tell me what your fourth John is like. And I told her, and she said, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Okay. <laughs> all right. They had to go in the I don't know bucket. I assume all of you have an I don't know bucket. <laughs> you have a big one. All right. So I just went in the I don't know bucket for 16 years. All right. And then I went on retreat with Powalk. The Venerable Powalk is a uh, jhana master from southern Burma who teaches the Sudhimaga jhanas, much deeper states of concentration. Uh, in order to get to the Sudhimaga jhana, you've got to get so concentrated in access concentration that you get beyond the diffuse white light all the way to a circle of light. Right? It may show up initially as, say, a purple circle. That's what it did for me. Right? That's the preliminary nimitta. Nimitta just means sign. Right? But if you get concentrated enough, you get a circle of white light. And that's what he calls access concentration. And then you can work with that, maybe get to the job, maybe. Right? Uh, so I went on this retreat. I knew from talking to students of his that the odds of me getting into his first jhana were quite slim. They said, yeah, plan on six months to learn his first jhana, right? I was there only for a month. But, uh, you know, let's see what he's doing. And so after yeah, a couple of weeks, I'm getting the purple nimitta, not real steady. Uh, but the other thing that would happen, I'd be just sitting there and I would suddenly get all this PT. I mean, just really vicious PT. I was shaking so bad, I was afraid my head was going to pop off. Right? So I go to Powalk and I tell him, I'm getting all this shit. I didn't use the word PT. I just described it. He says, that is gross PT. Do not let that happen. Okay. I mean, I knew it was PT and uh, I wasn't making it happen. Uh, maybe I shouldn't smile when I meditate, you know, because that seems to bring the PT on. So don't smile when I meditate. Just keep a really solemn expression. He also was having a sit for three or four hours at a sitting, right? None of this 45 minutes, right? So I'd gone back and was sitting in my room because I could sit in a chair there for hour, 45 minutes to two hours and slide over to the bed for 15 minutes just to give my body a break and then slide back into the chair, right? And keep that gross PT at bay and just try and get that purple circle to turn into a white circle if the purple <coughs> circle showed up and was stable, which wasn't real common. But after three or four hours, I smile. And I would get this incredible PT, I mean, just really violent shaking. It would last maybe 10 seconds, and then it would deposit me into the state of unbelievable happiness. I was grinning so big, it was gonna break my face. It was not first jhana, but second, because the PT had calmed down, and there was just this huge happiness, this very little PT in the background. I recognize it as second jhana, but much more intense second jhana than I had ever experienced before, which given three or four hours of access concentration, yeah, what I call access concentration, just sitting there following my breath for three or four hours. Right? When I triggered the jhana, it was really intense. So I'm there, you know, for like 10 minutes, and I'm like, wow, I wonder what third jhana is like. <laughs> I couldn't get the third jhana because the PT kept coming back. You know, it would show up and be there for 10 seconds and go away. You know, I was like, all right, take a breath, relax, PT, don't forget that. After about 15, 20 minutes, it just sort of slid over the edge. The PT was all gone, and now I was in a state of contentment. Here we had slid off into the third jhana. Wow. And I mean, just totally content. Never had jhanas this stable before. You know, 
uh, my mind wasn't going anywhere. It was really quite remarkable. What's fourth John like? Okay, take a breath, wipe that smile off. I couldn't wipe the smile off my face. You know, I'd relax the muscles and the smile would come back. I'm stuck in the third jhana. Can't get out of it. But after, I don't know, another five or 10 minutes, again, there was this sense of just going over the edge. And this time it dropped a long ways down until it deposited me in a place of quiet stillness. Fourth jhana. Only this time, my visual field was bright white. It was just like if I went outside and sat in the middle of a field on a bright sunny day and put a white sheet over my head and opened my eyes. Oh, yeah, exactly mm -hmm. what it says here, right? So clearly, although I had been doing fourth jhana before, I hadn't been doing it to the depths as being described in the suttas. I needed to spend longer in access concentration to get to that depth. And I find that I can get there with the white fourth jhana, basically if I'm on retreat, and I can't do that at home. You know, I've got to really get on a retreat, preferably a longer retreat, like a month-long retreat, and just work with it and get the concentration really up there. And then, yeah, then the fourth jhana will turn white again. So that's the four jhanas. Why bother? <laughs> well, when one's mind is thus concentrated, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, one directs and inclines it to knowing and seeing. One understands thus, this is my body having material form, composed of the four primary elements, originating from mother and father, built up out of rice and gruel, impermanent, subject to rubbing and pressing to dissolution and dispersion. And this is my consciousness, supported by it and bound up with it. The purpose of doing the jhanas is to generate a mind that's concentrated, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, which you can direct and incline to knowing and seeing, doing your insight practice. And what sort of insight practice? Investigation of body and mind. Uh, any of you ever heard of the Satipatthana Sutta? Right? There are 13 practices in there. Part one is body. Right? Part two is Vedna. Vedna are mind. Part three is mind states, well, that's mind. And part four is phenomena, but the phenomena that are described are mostly mind. The jhanas are a warm up exercise for your satipatthana practices, your foundations of mindfulness practices, All right? Get your mind concentrated and then investigate body and mind. And Satipatthana Sutta gives you 13 different practices to use for investigating body and mind. Getting enlightened is difficult. You know, it's probably easier to cut this wooden table in two with a butter knife. It's going to be hard, right? I mean, you know, you can make a little dent right away, but to cut it in two with a dull butter knife, that's going to be hard, really hard. But if you get a whetstone, put an edge on that butter knife, you can cut a lot faster, right? It's gonna get dull, you'll have to sharpen it up again. Go back to cutting. This is jhana practice. It's just sharpening your mind so that you have penetrating insight. In the Tibetan tradition, they talk about Manjushri, the bodhisattva of wisdom. He's often depicted with the sword that he uses to cut through the bonds of ignorance. Jhana practice is just sharpening Manjushri's sword. Right? You still gotta go wield the sword to cut the bonds of ignorance. And you don't wanna make the mistake of just sharpening, right? Because if you do that, then eventually you got no sword left. So the whole idea is you sit down, you step through these states, getting your mind as concentrated as you possibly can, 
and you step out and start doing insight practice. Yes, you lose this indistractability, this sharpness, just like you do if you're cutting something with a knife. It's okay. You started out really sharp, you'll get more insights. When it gets dull, then you go do your walking meditation and come back, get it sharp again, and do your insight practice. This is what the Buddha is laying out. This is the training for the monks and nuns. Lead a life that doesn't cause harm to yourself or others. Be like that. Sharpen up your mind with jhana practice. Investigate the nature of reality. And as a side benefit, your ego, which I assume everybody's aware, you have to make up, you have to think it up, emote it up, right? No bandwidth left with that while you're in these states, so it's out of the way. And when you're doing your inside practice, you're doing it from a less egocentric perspective, which is gonna give you a much better chance of seeing what's actually going on. Question. I want to say three questions there. Um, so the Tara and the Taka are concentration. So it's so interesting this because thinking and examining right. uh, don't seem to have the, the vibe of access concentration. No. And so now do you think it's a later interpretation or no, no I think the Vitaka Vichara is there essentially saying when you get to the first jhana, don't worry about the background thinking there. Just hang out in first jhana, and eventually it'll calm down and go away. But what's the gate to the, the in, in the sutta? What is the gate to the jhana? Because if you're talking about Charasama, they're just an obstacle. Right. They're, they're actually a gate, aren't they? They're, they're, <laughs> no. The gate shows up in the later commentaries. They're yeah. not a gate in the suttas. The, the, gate, the gate is abandoning the hindrance. It's secluded from sense desire, secluded from unwholesome state. What immediately precedes what I read you was the abandoning of the five hindrances. So is that an ethical injunction to abandon No, no, no. That's a, that's a skillful means for meditating. The ethical injunction is keep the precepts. So the Buddha is giving no instructions on how to abandon them in the sutta. So no, no, no. The abandoning of the hindrances is discussed in multiple places in the suttas. Right. I didn't do this here. I did it last night. Uh, okay. <laughs> I talked about it a bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, there are places in the suttas where it's talked about, and I don't have references for you right off the top of my head. But what you can do not from the suttas, is get to access concentration. Remember I said access concentration, you're fully with the object of meditation. And if there are thoughts, they're whispering in the background and not pulling you into distraction. Those same wispy, non-distracting thoughts can still exist in first jhana, but in order to get to the second, you need to get them calmed down. Vitaka and Vichar are often spoken of as factors of the first jhana, but they're actually defects in your concentration. They're not factors of the first jhana. But because they had come up with new and different states, they took these two defects, redefined them, and said that they were factors. And they said it was initial and sustained attention. However, that doesn't work either because you had initial and sustained attention to get to access concentration, right? And when you shift to the second jhana, Okay, maybe you only have sustained attention because it's still PP and Sukha. And maybe when you shift to the third jhana, it's still just sustained attention, right? But when you go to the fourth jhana, there's no PT or Sukha left, so there's going to have to be initial and sustained attention on the quiet stillness. Yet, the Sutta says Vitaka and Vichara go away with the start of the second jhana. So clearly, the Sutta is not talking about Vitaka and Vichara as factors. It's talking about them as defects. In my book that I wrote, everybody aware I wrote a book on the jhana. So the whole chapter on Vitaka and Vichara and how everybody else screwed it up except me. There is a term like Vichara, which is the attempt. Yeah. Why do you say Vitaka and Vichara? It becomes third. It means thinking and not. It, 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 what it really literally means is thinking and more thinking. It's a, a case of synonymous parallelism. 
Reach deep, saturate, and suffuse isn't yeah. four different things to do. It's just four similar ways for the same word, right? Okay, four similar words. Sim synonyms. Okay, vitaka vichara is again a sim synonym for there's background thinking, don't worry about it. It uses vitaka and vichara because they have alliteration. When you look at the Pali for the jhanas, there's a lot of alliteration and rhyming going on, which is very helpful for memorizing. Okay, um, the beyond pleasure and pain with the with the passing away of pleasure and pain and the previous passing away of joy and sorrow. There's so much alliteration and rhyming and uh, internal rhymes and so forth in there that it's quite amazing when you look at the Pali. And so you don't want to take everything quite too literally because part of what we're being presented with is the skill in memorizing the, the what, stock frame. What about protective and feeling? Is that PT and sleep are both. No, natural. no, but when you, the vehicle is added to you. Oh, oh. You okay. use pleasurable feeling. Right. So just prior to where I started with the first jhana, yeah. there's a, a series of Pamoja, PT, tranquility, sukha, concentration. Oh, okay. All right. The Pamoja is usually translated as something like gladness or worldly joy. And that's the pleasurable feeling that I'm telling you to focus on. Focus on some pomoja, right. the smile, your hands, whatever. That will convert into PT. When the PT calms down, you'll have the tranquility. <laughs> the tranquility can boost your sukha. Once you've got the sukha going well, you get the concentration. So that actually is there. Uh, it probably was a later insertion into the Sutta I'm reading this from, but it occurs in lots of different places in the Sutta. I mean, which casinos? Because I mean, a lot of people say casinos. Yeah, casinos are later. Casinos are color disc, and you would use it for concentration. That's all they're good for. You stare at the color disc, say it's red, and when you close your eyes, you see a green one. Yeah. All right, now you stare at the green one. If you can stabilize that, then eventually it'll turn into the nimitta, the how off are But that, the uh, uh, nimittas, the uh, casinos only show up, I think, in two places in the suttas and only listed, all right? So this would be probably stuff, let's say, a couple hundred years after the Buddha when they were inserted. Now my final question is, do you think the jhanas in Shuni Mata are deeper versions of what you teach, or are they different versions? Different. They're different. They're different. In what I thought they were just deeper versions yeah. until, I, until I started walk, working with Pao Off. And I actually did do another retreat with him and get to his first jhana. And as I'll talk about later, they are completely different in the sense that you have no awareness of anything. They are states of, well, suspended animation, basically. Yeah. Right? So they are eight different states. In fact, I have discovered 38 different states that go by the name jhana in the various literature. You got sutta jhanas, you got the abhidhamma jhanas, which are a little different. And then you got the sudhimagas jhanas, which are really different. Right? That's 25 states right there. And then you've got the pure land jhanas, and you've got the four stages of awakening, sometimes called jhanas. So that's eight and 25. This is 33. And then there's the so called ninth jhana, gives us 34. And there's four more jhanas. I can't remember all the time. <laughs> <laughs> In the Abhidhamma, they're blues. And so I slightly wonder because you get this idea of the jhanas being different, different cheaper, the range is grounds. Yeah. In the Abhidhamma, it actually talks about the jhanas very similar to the way they're talked about in the suttas. You can see it's similar states, but with more concentration, because by then, Vitaka Vichara has become initial and sustained. So it's more concentration by the Abhidhamma. So, the Abhidhamma. Because in the Mahayana suttas, he often says, the Buddha enters the samadhi of something. Yeah, now this Mahayana. teaching, you see, is, is that like a jhana? Is that, is that, is that, is that, well, now we're getting into the, the Mahayana and yeah. their understanding, which is quite different from the Theravada street. Uh, and so I hesitate to try and match things over like that. Uh, 
I don't know enough about what I'll, you're quoting from the Mahayana to really be able to say it. This is just the way Samadhi and Jhana are the same, is that correct? For the Buddha in the Theravada, yes, but by the time of the Mahayana, I don't know how much divergence it was from you know, some other idea of um, Samadhi. Right. I'm curious about um, understanding jhanas as also a tool for purification, mm -hmm. purification of mind and body. Right. And maybe you can talk about the aftermath that comes after. Like, do you see, a, 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 right. speaking from experience and like all the physical things that happen afterwards. Right. So, in order to get to the jhanas, <laughs> you have to stop doing the impure stuff. So, just the practice of it. <laughs> You're purifying just because you're practicing the jhanas. When you're in the jhanas, no bandwidth left over to do the impure stuff, right? You come out of it, your mind is so pure, right? So the insight practice and whatever you do next is nice and clean. So neuroscience tells us that whatever mental states you habitually hang out in, those are the ones that are gonna show up more than likely. So by hanging out in these purified states, you're reprogramming your brain to, instead of think about all the impure stuff, you know, it sort of like, likes to hang out in this cool stuff. Long term, again, say, noticing that whatever state you hang out in it tends to be uh, what shows up. We have an emotional set point, right? And if it's, over towards the right, that is more activity in the right prefrontal cortex, that's negative emotions. And if it's over towards the left, more activity in the left prefrontal cortex, that's positive emotions. And the balance between the two is your emotional set point and it can be reprogrammed. So by hanging out in the jhanas, which are positive emotional states, rapture, happiness, contentment, equanimity, Equanimity turns out to be positive, right? You're reprogramming your emotional set point to be more positive. The more positive your emotional set point, the less upset you are. And so the impure stuff that's associated with being upset, anger, <coughs> hatred, et cetera, is just less likely to arise. So it has long-term purification for that as well. Now this reprogramming yourself is probably a long-term project. In other words, you know, going on a 10 day retreat, learning some jhanas, yeah, probably going to need to do them for five years to get the reprogramming stuff happening. But, um, so I've done a lot of meditation for science, you know, EEG and fMRI. And one time I showed up to meditate uh, with EEG, and they said, well, we don't, we're not really interested in jhanas here. We want to try and build a biofeedback machine for access concentration. And we've wired it up to try and detect activity out of the nucleus accumbens, right? The center of your brain. The nucleus accumbens is the reward center, right? So somebody says, oh, you did a great job and you get that nice feeling because you yeah, you did a great job on their record. That's your reward center pumping out dopamine and opioids. All right? We know for sure that in the second jhana, they've got pictures of my, my brain in second jhana, and they can see that the reward center is on overdrive. All right? I'm pumping out these neurotransmitters, particularly dopamine, which will break down into norepinephrine, and I think that's the PP experience, and opioids, and I think that's the sukha experience. So what they wanted to do was have me meditate and get to access concentration and see what goes on in my nucleus accumbens, and they had set it up so that they could detect that. And I said, okay, so make it beep in the background before, uh, until I get it above the activity threshold, all right, and then make it stop beeping. Right, and they also had to rule out muscle tension. Right, if you have muscle tension while you have an EEG, it just you got nothing. You just got noise. All right, so I have to stay relaxed, which you can't really do first jhana and be relaxed because of the PT. Right, so we don't have EEG for the first jhana because muscle tension just completely destroys it. All right, so they had set up the machine and they wanted me 
to start meditating and see, could I drive the nucleus accumbens to, uh, figure, they figured it would, most people would have activity level of five, five flights, I don't remember. Okay, and they wanted to see, could I drive it up to 10 by getting to excess concentration? So they put their stuff on me and it didn't beep. And they looked and my base state was 10. They had been fooling with other people to find out how it worked. And most people, when they just sit there, it's at five and they have trouble pushing it up to 10. I'm sitting there at 10 without doing anything. Now, is this the result of my happy childhood? Is it the result of living in the Bay Area for 30 years? <laughs> or is it the result of, at that point, having done a quarter century of job practice? I don't know. All I know that was that my base state was, I, I was feeling more, twice as rewarded as anybody else when I'm sitting there doing nothing, All right? So they had to put it up, you know, stop beeping at 20. And so I meditate, I get to access, it's still beeping. I go to first John, of course, beeping all over the place. I get to second John, it stops beeping. Third John, it starts beeping again. Fourth John, it's beeping. Third John, it's still beeping. Second John, it stops beeping. Back to access, beeping. So they had screwed up and invented a second John biofeedback machine. All right. Um, so they discussed it some more and decided to look for decrease in theta out of here, de de decrease in gamma, I think, out of the sides of my brain. I don't remember what they were looking for, but decrease in selfing, basically. And we did that, and uh, definitely when I got to access concentration, it stopped beeping. In other words, I decreased that activity. And it stayed decreased all the way up to the fourth john and all the way back. And when I came out of access, it started beeping again. In fact, I was in second john and intentionally distracted myself. And it started beeping and then went back into the second shot and went away. So, um, on this topic, I'm just fascinated because when I've entered certain states, I can sense the activity in the brain. And I'm wondering in paying attention to whatever we're paying attention to, has anyone ever talked about paying attention to actual parts of your brain and concentration before? People have asked the question before, and I know of no one talking about it, and I don't know exactly how what we feel correlates with what's going on, okay? So I don't, I don't know there. You're going to need to talk to a neuroscientist and get some more information on that. But the, yeah, there's nothing in the literature that, or that I've ever heard about using the feelings in your brain as, as an object. Along those lines, you talk a little bit about, um, or if you have any familiarity with transcranial duress stimulation, with these ideas that somehow mechanically and materially you might be able to reduce these levels of concentration. Yeah. And so, if so, what might be lost by it? Sort of yeah. So, they can basically shoot electricity in your brain, you experience things. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm gonna let them look at my brain, but I'm not gonna let them mess with it. <laughs> <laughs> What's lost? Uh, well, you're not learning to do it yourself, okay? You can get really happy if you smoke some pot, right? <laughs> uh, you know, that doesn't solve your problems. Might be better to solve your problems and then be happy. You know, it's better for your lungs and all sorts of stuff, yeah. right? Uh, so it turns out that, yeah, it's possible that they can induce things into your brain that can be positive states. It may have some, what I call postcard effect, right? How many people have seen the Taj Mahal? Oh, wow. How many people have seen a picture of the Taj Mahal? <laughs> okay. For those of you who have seen the Taj Mahal and a picture of the Taj Mahal, is there any similarity? No, not really. The Taj Mahal is absolutely mind blowing. But you see a picture and you go, wow, that's a pretty cool building. I want to go see that. And so you, you stimulate your brain to a state you've never been in before. You might go, well, that's a pretty nice mind state. I'd like to learn to get there. But getting there by stimulating it doesn't seem to really do anything except, okay, right now you are there. Just like you smoke the joint and you're there. Better to learn to do it on your own. Would be my feedback. But it might have postcard effect. You 
It's not so much discursive, but it's more commenting on the experience. Okay. Yeah, as a, a discursive, I think of as going from one topic to another, you know, sort of wandering around. This is kind of investigating of the same investigation into the same yeah. kind of yeah. It's topic. it's more like commenting on. Oh wow, this is okay. pretty exciting. Oh, this has got to be the first John. I this is going to feel great. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas second John, you're just like. Yeah, I'll just yeah. So, yeah. so the vichara is the continuation of the same kind of wandering or ruminating or pondering over the same thing. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, that makes very good sense. Oh good. I'm very, very happy to hear this. Yeah, in most of the Indian languages, the word means the same. Right. What you have said. Good. But in the Adama literature, a different definition is given. Yeah, when you get to the Vasudhi Maga and the yeah. commentaries, they just Instead of realizing they'd gone down the wrong track, yeah. they just said, oh, well, let's just change the definition of the words to something they don't need. The second question is when you say about insight, is it that we have to intentionally look into the impermanence of the phenomena, the transitoriness, if we focus on that, or is it going to be uh, automatically we we'll get to that point? It helps to look intentionally. So, one of the practices that I give on the longer retreat, once somebody's gotten skilled with the jhanas, is, okay, I want you to pay attention to all of the arisings and passings that you can notice, all right? So sit down, run through your jhanas, then open up your attention while you're sitting there and just notice anything that arises and passes. It's gonna be sounds, there's gonna be body sensations, there's gonna be your breathing, there's gonna be thoughts, Bell rings, did you notice the arising and passing, right? You stand up, did you notice the passing of sitting and the arising of standing, the passing of standing, the arising of walking. Now do your walking meditation and noticing the arising and passing. You're eating, noticing the arising and passing. So it's very intentional at that point. Yeah. So um, in terms of understanding, how do the jars get concentration? What do you think? That is. Is there a term for that? The concentration that arises because of the jhana. Jhana concentration. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only term I've ever used. Right. Is that a, is that a, again, is there a canonical reference to it? Is there because in the you know, you look at the Abhidhamma and it's sort of different and I'm trying to understand. Yeah. About all you find is is what I read. After the fourth jhana, with a mind thus concentrated. Yeah. So it's the fourth jhana thus concentrated mind. It's about all, of it, but it's not a specific term. Uh, it's not ekagata, the word for it. Which? Ekagata or ekagata? Ekagata. Ekagata is, is, means one pointedness, all right? And it shows up in three suttas, okay? One kind of not really able to tell what's going on there or much about the sutta. The other two is very clearly pointing to the first jhana, and both of those suttas are clearly later compositions. All right, so the ikagata is associated with the jhanas doesn't show up until the very end of the sutta composition period. So let's say 200 years after the Buddha's death. And ikagata literally means one pointedness. In the Abhidhamma and the uh, commentaries, when they talk about the first jhana, they talk about five factors. Vitaka, vichara, which as we've discussed are actually defects. Piti and sukha, and ikagata, one pointedness. But the word ikagata doesn't show up in the suttas in relation to the first jhana, except in these two later suttas. One of them is majjhima, I think it's 43. <laughs> it's interesting. It says, what is the first jhana? It's a, it's a catechism, question and answers. What is the first jhana? And it's exactly what I 
great to be there, so please put those desires away, et cetera. And then the next question, what are the factors of the first jhana? And it lists the five factors with the cognitive, which wasn't mentioned in the exact paragraph before, mm -hmm. right? So that's one. Uh, the second one, second place it's mentioned is in Majima 111, which is a very late composition. It was actually from the early Abhidhamma period. Uh, I have a whole article on that on my website. So my book, of course, has a website. If you go to the website for my book, which you can get to from my website, obviously, uh, and click on the more, you know, like the extras on your DVD. The more is all the uh, stuff that I wrote that never made the final cut of the book. It's, it's the extra appendices. And there's a whole thing in there on Majima 111, how this is a late sutta, and you shouldn't be using that to try and understand what the Buddha was saying. It's, I would say it's composed after, it was probably composed in Sri Lanka after Buddhism went to Sri Lanka. So we're talking 250 years after the Buddha's death. Okay, so a very late sutta. And the other place it shows up is in, uh, I believe, the Mogalana part of the Connected Discourses, which uh, appears to be a late thing, and it's not really clear how it's being used there. It's not clear right here. So, Kagana is the word, but it's not in the suttas, really, in, in relation to the jhanas. But it shows up in the Abhidhamma and the Then, is Vipakta not a factor of jhanas? Upeka. The uh, equanimity. equanimity is a factor. In the third jhana, uh, with the fading away of rapture and by gaining uh, tranquility, by, by gaining tranquility, uh, mindfulness and clear comprehension, one enters and remains in the third jhana, which is of which the noble ones declare, happy is one who is equanimous, who pick up, and mindful. So it does show up in the third. And then it shows up in the fourth. Uh, the fourth jhana is mindfulness fully purified by equanimity. So it's very much, it's, it's mentioned in the third and it's at the heart of the fourth. I've always wondered about that phrase, mindfulness purified by equanimity. I'm wondering if it has anything to do with the, um, sometimes mindfulness seems to have a judgment that there'll be a little bit of a writing of a, of a like, don't like on mindfulness. Is that, yeah. is that what that phrase is referring to? Yeah. Um, so, Mindfulness in the suttas is just simply being aware of what's happening in the present moment with no context, right? So if you're going to go rob a bank and be successful, you're going to have to be extremely mindful, right? But you don't have what's called clear comprehension, sampanjana, right? The sampanjana is the context for it, right? So now, in the fourth jhana, you've got mindfulness, which is really strong, and it's been purified by equanimity. No wanting, no not wanting, no pleasure, no pain. It's mindfulness of just what's here and now. And so the context is not mentioned, but because of the equanimity, you don't have to worry about the context. Right. So we're talking about uh, vijnana, that is that sort of pure consciousness, or we're talking about the level of perception? Okay, so the word vijnana is used in at least five different ways in yeah. suttas. I was thinking of it in terms of, uh, of um, dependent origination. Yeah, so it's used in dependent origination, and it's quite debated how it shows up in there as to what exactly it's meaning. Well, I'm often wondering. Right. Uh, maybe I'll come back and do a day long on dependent origination here. Oh, right. And then we, then we can discuss that. Okay. <laughs> right, because, uh, yeah, it, it, there's a lot to say. There. Okay. Right. Um, 
but yeah, the mind. So it says that, okay, with the mind thus concentrated, etc. one inclines and directed. This is my body, etc. And this is my vinyana. But it's using vinyana there like mind. So this is my mind, which is bound up with and supported by the body. Right? So that's one of the ways that it gets used there. Uh, and so in the fourth jhana, when it says, uh, a state beyond pleasure and pain that contains mindfulness fully purified by equanimity, it's talking about a mind in the same way there, that your mind is fully purified, as opposed to some of the other meanings of vinyana. You get a sense of how uh, easy it is. Or to access the drama as described in the book. Uh, is it your experience that they are only accessible in a multi day retreat, secluded from your normal life, or for yeah. I, for example, as a lay person, do a self retreat on a weekend, 45 months, 45 hours, 45 months, like 78 hours? Yeah. There have been people who've learned the jhanas with their home practice. Right, but of all the people I've taught, it's a small minority. You know, we're talking single digit percent, you know, five percent, three percent, one percent. I don't know. It's not many. Most of the people that do that have a very good daily practice. Uh, I remember two people in particular who had a five hour a day daily practice. Okay, <laughs> yeah, pretty easy for them. Uh, for most people, because of the crazy lives we lead. To learn the jhanas, it's necessary really to get away and go on a longer retreat. Once you learn them, yeah, you can bring them home and with a you know, somewhat regular daily practice, keep them around, particularly if you do on the weekend, if you do yeah, 45 minutes on and off, etc. cetera. Yeah, you, you can keep them quite well. But in order to learn them, this that it's tricky. Uh, I say you have to be crazy to want to teach jhanas because I go into a retreat, I count the number of people, I multiply by the magic number, which is a fraction. <laughs> and I know about how many people are going to experience at least one jhana, one time. And it's not 100%, you know? Uh, and, you know, first half of the retreat, nobody's going to learn any jhanas. I got to be patient, they got to be patient. It's, it's quite tricky. Can you describe the difference, especially when your eyes are closed, the difference between equanimity jhana and sinking mind? Alertness. When you're in the fourth jhana, you're very alert to the quiet stillness. And when you come out of it, you're bright, clear, sharp, okay? Sinking mind, everything is just closing down, getting dull. So it's a dullness feeling to it. Um, with the increasing distractedness of our culture, do you see any impact in that on um, the, the umbrella globalization um, of people's ability to access? Yes. Oh, Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I'm not as good at the jhanas as I used to be. I used to have dial up internet. <laughs> you can hear the so yeah, uh, it's it, it is people learn them at about the same rate as when I first started teaching. Um, maybe I'm a better teacher, but it hasn't made much difference because people are more distracted. Uh, so yeah, we're doing a very, very, very big disservice to our brains and our culture with our short-term attention span. It's, it's quite harmful, I think. Um, yeah, part of why you gotta go on retreat. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like when I go on retreat to collect everybody's communication devices so that you can't be tempted to just check on because you never just check on, you also check on and this. So yeah, nice little ceremony. You turn in your device, put a sticker on it with your name. Hopefully I give it back to you. <laughs> um, the jhana that, I think it's on the fourth jhana, but where there's no sensation, and there's basically a numbness in 
like a, a it doesn't have to be. So it depends on how deep you are. It's not so much associated with the jhana, but the depth of the concentration. And the numbness would probably show up more because of a lack of energy in the state than the concentration. So when I was in the second jhana with Pao Off, I was more deeply concentrated than I'd ever been in fourth jhana. Okay, my mind was that indistractable. I could actually take it to a distraction and it would slip right back, you know? Uh, so it's the depth of concentration that determines really the depth of what's going on, not the particular jhana. But with good concentration at four, it's gonna be better than the same good concentration at two, because you're basically just getting to more subtle. Does the, um, when you come out, um, have that residual um, non, you know, no sensation, and does that still sustain, you know? You may not have the no sensation sense in the fourth jhana when it's really deep, in that your energy level is up enough that there is very definitely the sensation of quiet stillness, and that's it. And when you come out, it's very clear, okay? But if your energy level is down, then when you come out, it may still be down and it's kind of, yeah, dull. And so you want the energy level up. All right, I saw one hand over here and then if we go to talk about the higher jhanas, we're gonna have to get it. Um, we have the uh, there's been a lot written on the psychedelics recently, specifically psychedelics as it relates to meditation and in some cases specifically talking about jhana. The jhana states of consciousness as it relates to the psychedelic experience. Any thoughts on that and validity to that in your mind? post oxygen. Yeah, it'll give you a sense that there's something else out there. But, you know, seeing a postcard of Michelangelo's David is nothing like walking into that room and seeing this marble statue actually breathing. I mean, he did such a good job. You can't actually see the movement, but you can see his breathing. You just can't get that for a postcard. The same thing with the jhanas. Going there on your own with your own concentrated mind. I mean, look at how old I am. I, mean, I was a hippie. You know, I moved to San Francisco at 74, not because I was a hippie, but because I couldn't take the rednecks in the south anymore. <laughs> but I did my share of, well, I did my share of pot and sick oil people as well. And I did. <laughs> acid and coke and all that sort of stuff. I learned some stuff from it, but I learned a lot more from getting jhanically concentrated really a lot more. Yeah. So yeah, postcard. All right, so we gotta do the higher jhanas. Yes. All right. So Coming out of four, you can go to insight practice or you can go to the immaterial states. They're not called jhanas in the suttas, they're called immaterial states. Uh, by the time of the Abhidhamma, they were just being called the eight jhanas as opposed to the four jhanas and the four immaterial states, which is kind of a nice way to uh, talk about all eight states. They certainly appear as a sequence of eight states in the suttas at times. Most often you find the four. <laughs> Sometimes you find just the second four. Sometimes you find all eight. Sometimes you find seven. Sometimes you, yeah, it's all over the place. But mostly you find the four or the other four or all eight together. So these other ones are immaterial states. Notice in each of the previous jhanas we had drink, steep, saturate, and suffuse one's body, right? so that your body is filled with piti and sukha. So body awareness continues through all four jhanas in the suttas. But these immaterial states, immaterial, there's no body sensation. So the fifth jhana, by passing entirely beyond all bodily sensations, by paying no attention to the perception of diversity, seeing that space is infinite, one reaches and remains in infinite space. Right, so the first thing is you need a good fourth jhana so that when you come out of it, you can go beyond all bodily sensations. Right, and the method for getting to this space, infinite space 
is to find something that you can expand. What Ayakima told me was get in sense of the, the uh, sense of my body, my being, and expand it to fill the room. And then expand it to fill the building. And then the neighborhood. And then the whole of the San Francisco Peninsula. And then out to the horizon and just keep going. It doesn't matter what you expand. It can be something imaginary like a balloon. It can be the sense of your being. But if you can stay focused on outward expansion, it's bigger, 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 bigger. Eventually, a vast, empty space appears before you. It's quite dramatic. Right? I mean, you're just expanding, expanding, and suddenly, oh, uh, it's like you're walking across the Arizona desert, you come to the Grand Canyon, only there's no bottom and there's no other side. Right? Before that, it was just cactus and sand, and then, oh my God, that's big. Right? So this is the fifth jhana. It's called the, the realm of infinite space. It's interpreted to be an actual place by the commentaries. Uh, I don't think that's what the Buddha thought. Uh, the word that's used, it could be actually the sense of infinite space. Because the word that's used for realm is the same as for the eye, your senses. So the sense of infinite space. And you have no awareness of your body. It's just this big space. All right? It might appear as off-white, light gray. It may or may not have a horizon line. Or it could show up as black, but no stars or galaxies or anything like that, just big empty space, All right? Get good at it, sustain it for five to 10 minutes, All right? And then you can move on to infinite consciousness. And it says, by passing entirely beyond the realm of infinite space, seeing that consciousness is infinite, one enters and remains in infinite consciousness. <laughs> Not a lot of instruction. <laughs> <laughs> the trick is to realize that you cannot be aware of an infinite space with a limited awareness. To be conscious of an infinite space, you have to have an infinite consciousness. Can you shift your attention from the space mm -hmm to your consciousness of the space. Can you become aware of your infinite awareness? <laughs> if you can make that shift, it, what it feels like is you turn back and you become absorbed into the space and you become this infinite consciousness. Your mind has suddenly gotten huge, right? You are now the infinite consciousness. If you come from a spiritual tradition where the goal of your spiritual practice is union with everything, you're there. <laughs> Except, of course, the Buddha wasn't teaching that. And uh, you haven't actually achieved union with everything. You're having a mental experience that you interpret as, I have an infinite consciousness. Just like right before you had one, I'm perceiving an infinite space, right? It's a mental state. It's not a, an actual thing that's happening. Right? It's, it's, a, it's a pattern in your brain. I've seen the pattern. Okay, they do the EEG and I can see each of the jhanas has a different pattern that shows up. And this is just a different pattern. Right? If you get it really good, it may seem like there are other consciousnesses within that infinite consciousness. You know, a little consciousness over here. You more over there. It's not that you can read the minds of anybody else in the room. It just seems like that. But you got to have a really good six jhana to get there. I've only experienced that a half a dozen times, maybe. Okay, when I get it really good, I'll get that. It's like, oh, that's good. <laughs> right? But mostly, it's just like, wow, look how big my mind is. Visually, not much to see. It's just dark. That's the way most people describe it. Now, I'm describing it for a visual person. If you're kinesthetic or auditory, maybe you don't see anything at all. Seventh jhana is the realm of no thingness, nothingness. Think by passing entirely beyond the realm of infinite consciousness, 
seeing that there is no thing, one enters and remains in the realm of no thingness. Right? So this is nothingness. This is not the emptiness that's talked about in the Mahayana tradition. That's different. We'll talk about that when we talk about dependent origination. Right? This is an experience of the void, you could say. People who stumble into this state, people stumble into these states out of order. Okay, you get really concentrated and find themselves just in the third jhana or seventh jhana. If they stumble into the seventh jhana, it usually freaks them out because they've fallen into the void. All right? They go run into the teacher, the teacher tells them, take a shower, get something to eat, don't meditate for a few days. <laughs> I know this because they come on retreat with me. And they tell me about it. I go, well, it sounds like the seventh jhana. And they go, yeah, that's really scary. No, 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 you'll be fine. So then they learn the first six jhanas. And I say, okay, here's how you get to seven. And they're like, I don't know if I want to go back there. <laughs> but they go back there and they go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's exactly where I was. Only this time it wasn't scary. The only reason it was scary, because they didn't know what it was. There's nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing there at all. It's like you go down into the basement and you hit the light switch and it doesn't work. And you're trying to see what's down there. You can tell right in front of you there's nothing. Your eyes get a little more accustomed to there's nothing over here, there's nothing over there. And why there's nothing down here at all? That's the experience of the seventh jhana. Right? The trick for getting there, you've got the infinite mind of the infinite consciousness jhana. What's it conscious of? Well, the space is long gone. What it's conscious of is nothing. Put your attention on the nothing. At first, it might be a small nothing. Then you stick with it, look at the edges, you know, this could be a bigger nothing. It doesn't ever get infinite. But you get a nice big nothing. If you're visual, you'll see it as something dark, like black, deep purple, uh, dark blue, something like that. Or you might see it as, remember the old TV, you turn it to where there wasn't a channel, you got black and white static? Okay, can you imagine black and black static? Okay, you might see this sort of very fast moving little, not even specks. You can't even tell what it is. There's nothing there. So either just a big void with nothing in it or this static thing, if you see it visually. Uh, it's a great place to hang out because there's nothing to bother you. It's my favorite genre. <laughs> <laughs> and then the eighth jhana. The eighth jhana is the realm of neither perception or non-perception. Perception is a translation of the Pali word sanya. Sanya is, um, means the ability to name things, to identify things. Uh, people see the Buddha over here? See a, a figure, I can't tell, is that an apple fish bar or something? See that? No. It's just colored shapes. That's all that's there is colored shapes. You make it up in your mind. Look, look back here. You see the horns on this creature? See those horns? Not any horns, just colored shapes. Right? That's what Sanya is. Perception is how it's usually translated. I prefer to translate it as conceptualizing. Right? Conceptualization. So I conceptualize horns when I see those colored shapes. I conceptualize rug when I see this shape. I conceptualize light bulb when I see that. Right? Everything that you experience is your concepts, pretty much. I mean, sometimes you get pure pleasure and pain, right? but mostly it's our concepts. Do you hear the kids out there? No, you just heard a sound. You conceptualize it as the kids. All right, so this state is neither conceptualizing nor not conceptualizing. It's a state that has no characteristics by which you can describe it. Yet, when you're in it, you know that your mind is in a state that has no characteristics by which you can describe it, and you can stay in such a state. Uh, that probably didn't really help a lot. <laughs> That's because it has no characteristics by which you can describe it other than is a state that has no characteristics by which describe it. Um, it's far more fragile than any of the other jhanas. If this, 
if this is the third jhana, and this is your one-pointed attention on it, it's possible to you know, sort of slip off and get back before it disappears. You know, you start thinking, whoops, right? It's not like you start thinking it's gone, right? It starts to fade out, and then you come back to it and get it strong again, right? You're just sort of wobbling. You can even do that with the seventh jhana. Nothing, one point in case it starts to slip, you better get back there quick or it's gonna be gone. Eighth jhana, uh, you got time for maybe one simple sentence not containing the words I, me, or mine. <laughs> I could not tell you the number of times I've been in the eighth jhana. It's a really good eighth jhana. And the next thing I'm in the middle of some paragraph of distraction and have no idea how I got there. And it's very fragile. Uh, but it does boost your concentration even further. The good news, if you've got a good seventh jhana, it's fairly easy to find eight. All you have to do is get a big nothing and let it collapse and come to rest in front of your face and see if your mind goes into a space that has no characteristics by which you can describe it, but you can stay there. <laughs> get good at seven first, we'll talk again. All right, so these are the higher jhanas, the immaterial states. They produce more concentration, more clarity, more sharpness, right? I notice a distinct difference between coming out of four and coming out of eight in terms of how quiet my mind is. Right? Four is pretty good. I go, if I come out of eight, it's like, yeah, all right, that's a boost. It's definitely better, right? Uh, I don't know that they would have any long-term benefits uh, I mean, you know, hanging out in rapture and happiness is going to make you a happier person long term, but I don't know hanging out in nothing is going to help all that much. Uh, but the concentration did, and they're purifying because, yeah, they, these states are really refined, much more subtle. The jhanas, as you may have detected, are in increasing order of subtle, subtle, increasing order of subtle. Uh, so you use one to up your concentration enough so you can find and stay with the next one and use it to up your right, get the picture. There is another state called the ninth jhana sometimes. It's not referred to as the ninth jhana in the suttas, although it's talked about. It's called the cessation of feeling and perception. It's a state of suspended animation. It's a state of... Uh, well, no feeling, that's phedna, so no pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, and no perception, that's the conceptualizing, no identifying or anything. So you're just, you're not unconscious, but you're just completely oblivious, right? Uh, the Buddha talked about it. He had a bad back, and when he was old, uh, he said that the only relief he could get was to enter into Naroda. Otherwise, it was painful for him. So sometimes he would do that. I don't think it's particularly useful, except maybe, you know, you, you got a root canal or something. You can try that. And, you know, wouldn't need the Novocaine or anything. Uh, it is said that coming back from it, if you pay careful attention, you can watch yourself reassemble, and this can give you insight into not self. You can see that it's not there, and then you watch it reassemble. That's about all I can tell you about it, except for three things. One, there's a documentary called uh, Shortcut to Nirvana. It's a documentary on the Kumbh Maya Festival, which was held in India in, I believe, 2001. Uh, Kumbh Maya Festival, uh, well, I think 12 million people came, 20 million. Uh, makes Woodstock look like a backyard cricket, right? And it's, it's a Hindu festival, and it's a great documentary. Very, very interesting. All these sadhus, it's got the Dalai Lama, it's got, it, it's really good. But in one scene, they've dug a pit. And this Japanese woman climbs down a ladder, they pull the ladder out, they put roofing tin over it, they cover the roofing tin with dirt, end of scene. And you're back to the sadhu, and here's the Dalai Lama again, and, you know, and three days later they come back, they're sweeping off the dirt, they pick up the roofing tin, and she climbs out. She obviously had put herself into the state of Naroda for three days. Oh. 
the astronauts, they put them in isolation tanks. And after about, you know, eight hours, they all started getting, well, a little too crazy to leave them in. And she was in there for three days and she's fine. She surely was in the state of neurosis. The other experience I saw of somebody in it, I was in Thailand for Thai New Year's one time. New Year's is at the end of the uh, hot season, the start of the rainy season. It's in the spring, in April. And the Thais do their spring cleaning. And so uh, you would wash the Buddha statue in the altar in your house. And the tradition developed, you would take some of the water from washing the Buddha statue and sprinkle it on the hands of your elders to salute their Buddha nature. Well, in modern times, the sprinkling has gotten uh, a bit out of hand with everybody in the country throwing buckets of water on everybody else in the country. <laughs> it's quite a participatory festival. Uh. You step outside the door of your guest house and you're greeted with a bucket of water. You better have your own bucket. <laughs> um, it's 100 degrees out, so no big deal. So I went down to the main square in Chiang Mai, the center of the activity there, and they had set up spigots along the street there. You know, they'd see me coming in and go, one pot, one pot. So I put in a one pot coin, four cents, and you know, the water would come out into the buckets that the ties had arranged there. And I could refill my bucket, which of course I had used up walking to the main square. Uh, and people are throwing water in the passing buses and on the passing cars. And if you come by on a motorcycle, you're done. <laughs> right? It's, yeah, it's chaos. It's absolutely chaos. And in the main square, off to one side, they built a little pavilion. And seated in the pavilion was a monk. Full lotus, eyes open, downcast. He had the most serene look on his face I have ever seen in my entire life. It was quite inspiring to see somebody meditating in the midst of this chaos, because, you know, there's all sorts of stuff going on. There's a big parade coming through that afternoon. He's still sitting there, right? There's a beauty pageant right over here that night. He's still sitting there. There's more chaos the next day. He's still sitting there, right? He was there for the second round of the beauty pageant that night. On the third day, he looked a little tired, serenely tired. He was there in the afternoon when the biggest parade of all comes through. He was there that night for the finals of the beauty pageant. Never moved, never blinked. He had to have been in the state of Naroda for three days. He was gone the next day. Uh, it was quite inspiring to see this. And the other experience I can tell you about Naroda, so I sat with Powalk a second time. I went to the forest refuge and was there for two and a half months before he showed up. And he was there for four months. So I got my six month retreat in with him. And I did actually get to his first jhana once. I did get the nimitta, the bright white nimitta regularly after about a month of working with him. So three and a half months into my retreat of working with concentration, I got the bright nimitta. But that's only access concentration in his system. What you have to do is absorb into it. And one afternoon, I did. And I figure I was gone for probably around 45 minutes, judging from a few cues I had. During that time, I was gone. You know, I was not asleep. I was still aware of the nimitta. There were no body sensations. There were no sounds. There was nothing but that nimitta. And I was just absorbed. There was no feeling or perception. It was basically the first Vasudhi Maga jhana is equivalent to the ninth jhana of the suttas, the state of neither perception or not, uh, the state of uh, neither uh, feeling or perception, right? So you're just gone. So of course the question I'm sure you're asking, if that's the First of the Vasudhi Maga, what are the others? <laughs> well, you can't tell where you are till you come out. When you come out of that absorbed state, then you can look at your heart center. And I, when Powell told me that, I pointed to here, he goes, okay. So if you look down into your left, after having had your eyes closed for a long time, you're gonna get some light peach. And that's, he said, he didn't say it was light leakage. He said, it's the reflection of the nimitta. You know? 
And if you look at that, then you can see what the factors were of the experience you just had. Was there initial and sustained attention? Was there PT, Suka, one point in this? Well, yeah, I could definitely see those. So I was in the first jhana. Apparently coming out of the second, I didn't get there. You don't see initial and sustained attention. You just see uh, PT, Suka, and one point in this, et cetera. And for the third, you only see Suka and one point in this. And for the fourth, only equanimity. But you don't know till you come out. So this is really different from the jhanas of the suttas, where you know exactly where you are, you have bodily awareness, so you can drench deep, saturate, and suffuse in the first four. You're very aware of where you are in the, in the higher four. So it's a, well, it's an interesting state. Uh, I have no particular desire to go back to it. If it happens, it would be interesting to go back there. But I'll, I'll probably pretty much stick with the eight. They, they seem to help a lot. All right, more questions. Uh, two questions. The first is, um, can a person just drop into, say, the seventh jhana without trying? And well, they would probably be meditating. Well, yes. Okay, not, so. Just not watching the dishes. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so they, this has happened to a number of people that were on the three-month course at IMS, and they're just meditating away, doing their vipassana, and they fall into a jhana, and the seventh jhana is one of them. So people do fall in out of order. I stumbled into the first jhana. I was just following my breath. I stumbled into the first jhana, okay? And at, at a later point, I'd figured out how I was getting there and actually stumbled into the second, but didn't recognize it was different from the first. It just seemed like Whatever this thing was, I didn't have the word jhana associated with it. It just got a little quieter. So people do stumble in all the time. I would say that somewhere around 10% of the students that come on retreat with me talk about having stumbled in. And a lot of people stumble in, particularly to the earlier jhanas as a kid. I've had a lot of people that, I used to do second jhana as a kid, or had one student who knew all four jhanas for when she was a kid. I've had a few students who had access to five, six, and seven as kids, probably totaling four or five people, but a few people. Uh, nobody, nobody reports stumbling into eight until they get there again, and it's like, yeah, I actually have been here. It's so subtle. Uh, but yeah, people do stumble in out, out of order and unintentionally. Interesting. Um, and then the second question is, the cessation, um, of the ninth jhana, is that the same cessation event that is often I've heard associated with in the four path model as a sort of signifier of stream injury or it's different, right? It's the same word, okay, okay but it's the rota. It, it's used, I think, in seven different ways in the suttas. So the cessation of feeling and perception, that's the rota, the ninth jhana. The cessation of greed, hatred, and delusion. That's full awakening, right? That's what it means to get enlightened, right? There's the blink out in the four path model described in the commentaries. That's still the same word in Naroda, but it's a different sensation. Um, the cessation of the Vitaka and Vichara to go from first jhana to second jhana, still the same word. So yeah, it gets used in a lot of different ways and you have to really be careful about the context. I think I wrote an article on that. Uh, I, think I, I think that's part of the more um, for my book. Thank you. Right, where I just listed the seven different ways that it's used. Um, so parts of the question, well, I think it's just One, you mentioned that you would talk about ending it in a higher later, but I'm wondering if you can give a little bit of Glimpse of it, and you talk about emptiness. Emptiness. And you said that you will talk about emptiness in Mahayana in, yeah, when you talk about yeah, dependent origination. I'm curious. I'm really dependent on origination, but I'm really curious to hear what what you what you what is your view for emptiness in Mahayana. Right. And okay, let me do that one real quick. Everything arises dependent on other things. Nothing stands on its own. Right? Nothing has any essence. If I ask you what is this, you're going to tell me it's a table. No, it's dead trees. No, it's carbon dioxide and sunshine and rain and minerals from the earth. 
No, it's a product of the Big Bang. They got twisted around inside a few supernovas and, right? Okay, everything is rises dependent on other things. That's the emptiness of the Mahayana and its relationship to dependent origination. And then um, my understanding is that you, you experience jhana, there's a residual that would remain with you after, after med, coming out from meditation. Um, in your experience, let's say, if you've been to first jhana, second jhana, you leave it at that state. Um, have you, what, what did you notice how long the you know, extreme happiness lasts? Right, the happiness. What, 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 what does it depend on? Yeah, the happiness probably doesn't last that long once you get skilled at the jhana. Maybe the first time you hit it, it's like, wow, and it lasts maybe for a few days. So that's fairly rare. Usually it lasts for maybe an hour or two at the most for some people. Uh, what really strikes me is the concentration level. Right here, right now, looking at you, I can see the pansies outside the meditation hall where I learned the eighth jhana. Okay, the concentration level was so great when I walked outside and looked at those pansies. It was like, whoa, I never saw flowers like this before. And I have somewhat of photographic memory, and that's a picture that's in there. And I can draw it up anytime I want. So what the real residual is the concentration level, which is you use it for your inside practice, but it might still be way up even when you go out to do your walking meditation. The happiness, the rapture, they fade out pretty quickly. You want the rapture to fade out because it's, it gets old really quick. The happiness, it doesn't fade to anything negative. It just comes down from where it was. And it's probably got a, quite a long tail on it where you're just in a slightly better mood having been in there. But it's not as dramatic as the level of concentration where you walk outside and the colors are more vivid and smells are more alive and things like that. Sir, can you give us a few remarks on the pure land jars? No. It's been too long <laughs> since I played with them. I don't remember. But if you plug it into Mr. Google, he'll give you lots of stuff. But I don't remember enough about it. Sorry. Um, I'm curious about, uh, so entering Donic states, you talk about, obviously, it's to summarize that it is, it is uh, sort of, for lack of a better word, interesting in and of itself, and it heightens your concentration for insight meditation. Right. In addition, it seems to me that there are lessons in the Donic states themselves as to the Yes. Reality, uh, you know. Yes. <laughs> yes. And so I just love to hear you talk a little about that. Well, I, you know, you know what a spoiler is? <laughs> I don't want to give you the spoilers for well, the insights. No, but you've already just comment yeah. on that. Yes, there are. I yes, mean, there are. <laughs> that's all. Yes, there are insights associated with all of the genres. Okay, and by entering into those states, you learn some of what, how your mind works. Just the ex exploration itself gives you insight into how your mind works. I already mentioned, you find that, you know, the happiness doesn't have to come from outside. It's actually in there. You just got to learn to trigger it. You can trigger it without an external stimulus. That's pretty big insight, actually. And so there are insights like that associated with each of the jobs. I was just going to say, it's not because of an inside experience of it, but just to even speak of perception, uh, those, the, those are merely colors and shapes. Mm -hmm. that, that's a that's a insight yes. in and of itself. It's very valuable. It's the deconstructing the solidity of our, our experience, which is really one of the yeah. higher you know, goals. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. One of the things I was going to figure out a way to weave into this, just to pass along a little bit to everybody. Thank you for the opening. Okay, so Nibbana, awakening, enlightenment, seems to entail no longer getting confused about your concepts. To realize that everything you're experiencing is conceptual. You hear the dog? 
No, you don't hear the dog. You hear a sound and you interpret it as a dog. Right? See the light? No, you see a colored shape and you interpret it as a light. Okay? It turns out the whole world is nothing but concepts. The whole world of your experience. Now, I do believe there's something out there. Right? And that my concepts are in some way uh, somewhat of a reflection of what's going on out there. I, I use that to actually go up a flight of stairs. It's falling on my face. Right? That I'm, I'm able to perceive things that actually makes me able to navigate the out there. But we so often get fooled by our concepts and think our concepts are what it's all about. And I have proof that I'm not making it all up in my own head. And that is that I am not sick enough to have imagined Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'm not that crazy. I couldn't possibly have come up with even W, let alone Trump. Right? So uh, that's my proof that there is an out there, but it's all filtered through our conceptualizing. And the Buddha's breakthrough seems to be to no longer be fooled by your concepts, to actually escape your concepts. When you can do that, the tendency to grasp and cling to the concepts goes away with no craving and clinging, no dukkha awakening. So thank you for the opening. Ask you about the phenomenology of the giants. There's obviously it's different in type from normal concentration. Yes. In a way that the customer is not. Yes. What is that? Phenom what, what is the phenomenology of it? Because it, this is a very, it seems to be a lot of the, the um, measurements that are made in meditators show an increase of something that's already present in non meditating. Right. There's something about the giant that's actually different. And you come in and out of it. Right. As if it's a step change or something. So our, all of our experiences do our transmitters, right? We, you don't experience anything except your newer transmitters yeah. running a, a pattern in your head. Okay, there's no solidity, it's just you know a chain firing off in your head. Apparently, my best guess is that PT is dopamine breaking down into norepinephrine. We don't normally experience that big a hit of dopamine breaking down into norepinephrine. Um, sometimes when we're in a situation, we get that, but not just sitting around. Uh, Suka appears to be opioids. We know that the uh, nucleus accumbens, the reward center, pumps out dopamine and opioids. Right? So I'm guessing that the jhanas are a significantly different dose of neurotransmitters, right? Um, so for the first jhana, it's a lot of dopamine breaking down into norepinephrine accompanied by opioids. The second jhana, it's opioids with a residual of dopamine breaking into norepinephrine. For the third jhana, the dopamine is out of the picture and they're just opioids. And for the fourth jhana, now the opioids are gone, and there's just the residual of having passed through these states, which got you quite quiet, and now you're in quiet stillness. Fourth jhana. The higher jhanas are very, very different. All that I can really say, um, if you know anything about chaos theory, there are strange attractors. Right? This is mathematics. Right? But if you have something in chaos theory, Oh, a mathematical function. Most to it, it often will evolve into the strange attractor function. Right? If you just set it up and let it go, it just sort of wanders into this strange attractor. It looks a little different to start with, but then as it plays out, it goes into the strange attraction. Uh, you could think of this as like harmonics, right? If you strike things, they have this harmonic that they're going to vibrate at. It's going to make a tone, right? And you make another tone close to that, right? And this is sort of going to vibrate a little bit, but if you put it right at it, it will vibrate a lot more. It's sort of attracted to that. 
Okay, the higher jhanas, in fact, all of the jhanas probably, seem to be patterns in our brain that are strange attractors. If you're concentrated enough and you get a big enough sense of space, that's close enough to the strange attractor of the fifth jhana that it attracts into this pattern. And this is a pattern that we don't normally run. And so you experience it as infinite space. But it's a stable pattern, which is why you can maintain it. The stability of the eighth jhana is not very strong, and it's much more difficult to maintain. But five, six, and seven, you can maintain actually fairly easy once you get skilled at them. So they seem to be strange attractors that will sort of pull you into the state, and then it's stable, and you can stay in the state. So it's, I mean, it's, I used with phenomenology, you get a third party description. Um, is the phenomenology one of being unified with the object? That sensation as you go into the jhanas, you somehow just plop onto the, you know, the state. What's the, what's the, the phenomenology of the change of state? It seems that what, I, mean, okay. I get all this stuff. But right, okay. So from an internal, there's the phenomenology of one pointedness on the object, the access method, the breath, or the method. So the phenomena is, this has become my universe right now, okay? And then there's the thought that arises, oh, time to switch to the pleasant. And now there's the phenomena of just experiencing the pleasant. And then there's this rush as the first jhana comes. There's no intention or anything. It just comes and takes you away, and your attention immediately is drawn to that and stays focused on it. So it's the Right, so the, the rush is both bodily and emotional. There's the PT, which is bodily, and the emotional, the sutta. Does it appear to arise from the learn? It's, for most people, they just say it comes up. Yeah. Occasionally, I get people saying it comes down, but it doesn't matter. It's just, if you got PT and sutta, can you sustain it? Can you sustain your attention? Okay, okay I'll call it one. Right? And now there's a shift to a quieter PT and you're focused more on the sukha part. So the phenomena is being happy with a little energy in the background and then content with no energy in the background and then quiet stillness. Those, those are the phenomena you experience. So that is very much from what you just described. And that really is the screen of the phenomena. Yeah. So the fact that I can teach this isn't because I'm a good teacher. It's because your brains are programmed and I just know you the trick to say, hey, lift up the rug and there's a trap door under it. You know, I didn't put the trap door in there. You came wired that way, right? And I just happen to know the trick to enable you to open up what's already there. Okay, we're gonna go around the room. Everybody has a question, raise your hand. <laughs> All right, that. okay. <laughs> if you didn't raise your hand, you missed out. <laughs> It's just my, um, my observation that um, teaching jhanas on retreats is not all that common. In this is very true. The positive world. So if one wanted to practice jhanas on a retreat, would you recommend doing that? And if so, what kind of structure um, would you advise? Well, the, the, the first advice would be to go on a retreat where they're being taught. So Obviously, you can, yes. Right. Yeah. If you don't have that, I did write a book. I okay. did try and write it as best I could for, all right, you want to learn the jhanas from a book? You can't do that, but here you go. <laughs> all right. So I laid out the details as much as I could. And after each of the jhanas, it's like, okay, here are the possible pitfalls you could encounter and things like that. So you would structure it by doing lots of sitting and not so much walking. Uh, sit before breakfast, if you're fixing your own food, uh, you know, make it simple so you don't have much to do. Uh, sit, walk, sit, walk, long sittings, an hour, hour and a half. If you come on retreat with me in the afternoon, I'm doing interviews and it's set up so there's a bell every half hour. And so you could do a half hour sit, but you aren't gonna get any jhanas. Or you could do an hour, but if you really want the jhanas, you wanna do an hour and a half or longer. And just, you know, basically stay until your body doesn't want to do that anymore, then go do some walking meditation, come back and do it again. So long sits. Uh, in the evening, if you're doing self-retreat, listen to a Dharma talk by somebody you really appreciate, you know, sit some. Uh, sitting and walking ought to take about eight hours a day of, of doing that. Right. What else? 
Coming this way, have your hand up, yes. Yeah. <laughs> One of my teachers talked about um, what he called Lokutra Ajana. And he distinguished it from the Loki Ajana is what you need to, that Lokutra Ajana is possible to take that into the world, get off the cushion and engaging in the world and maintain some states of that. You know. so I'd like to get your thoughts on it, if you can offer any comments. When I'm in the jhanas, I'm in a space that has no bandwidth for doing anything except being in the job. When I come out and go back into the world, there's far too much going on to be in the jhanas. However, there are teachers, Bhante Vimala Ramsey, who says so you can do dishes in the eighth job. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> you can find pretty much anything out there. Uh, looking at what is described in the suttas, um, they're deeply enough concentrated that, yeah, you can't really go out into the world with them. But you can go out into the world with the insights you gain from your insight practice post jhana, and that will change your world profoundly. So that's the best I can offer you. So I'm going to ask a couple questions. I'm going to ask a couple questions if possible. Okay. Uh, first is you mentioned, I'm going to repeat it because I didn't have a time to write it down. Um, to go from fourth jhana to the immaterial space, is it just going to have a good base? It's kind of like a good, strong place where you are, but could you say a little bit more about that? Because you said a few things, but I didn't get a chance okay. to them So you're in the fourth jhana. You may find yourself slumped over in four because the energy is so damn. Straighten yourself up. Find something you can expand, like the boundaries of your being, and expand them First, fill the room, the building, the neighborhood, the area to the horizon and keep going. Span them without limit. Stay focused on the outer edges of the expansion. Don't look for the space. If you look for the space, you're not focused on the outer edges of the expansion. If you can stay with the outer edges of the expansion and just keep it going, then a vast empty space appears before you. If it gets stuck, you have to push through or go in a different direction. But don't look for the space. Thank you. Thank you. And my other question, um, I don't feel like I've experienced that, but like you said, sometimes it might be possible to do things out of order. Yes. I am guessing that this was in my head, a concept. Sometimes we have a concept of Okay, I've got like you described, that's very different than actually being in it. I'm assuming that um, for the other immaterial space, say, such as, I don't know, any of them say, um, there's a big gulf between, oh yeah, I think I've experienced that versus I don't like perfectly. I've yeah. experienced that. Right. That's what I figured, but I thought it was just. Yeah. <laughs> One of the pitfalls of teaching the jhanas is that my students really want the jhanas and they're willing to settle for a semi-reasonable facsimile when it's not the real thing. And it's, yeah, it's difficult for me as a teacher to tell what you experience except what you tell me. And uh, yeah, and then there's the, if I go, nah, you didn't get there. <laughs> that doesn't work real well. <laughs> so I've got to take whatever you give me, and if I don't think you quite got there, I've got to somehow express it to you that, yeah, you're doing good, keep going, this is good, there, you can get it better without scaring you away and making you think you're a failure or anything. Yeah, it's, you have to be crazy to teach John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As you process that, has that allowed you to see, um, to experience in a different way? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's less of a tendency to pin my hopes on what's out there, right? That this is going to do it for me. 
it is out there. It's producing this concept in me. Right? Um, the biggest thing is that when things go wrong, I don't freak out as badly as I used to. That's, that's the most rewarding part. I mean, things still go wrong, no doubt about that, but I just don't get as freaked out as I used to. I got really sick about two and a half years ago. The first day that it hit, I'm laying there in bed going, uh, well, if I die, I've had a pretty good life. And the fact that that was my attitude, I mean, I thought I might die. I was that sick. And it was just, well, I've had a pretty good life as opposed to getting freaked out or you know, upset or anything and just able to appreciate what an incredible experience I've had. So it, 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 it changes you. It changes you in ways it's hard to talk about it. Anymore. On that, just to follow up on that, there seems to be a non-doing aspect, a non-doing, just very deep relaxation where you're literally not doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good place to hang out in. It won't get you fed, right? <laughs> but it will give you, give you a chance to gain insight into what's actually going on. Just stop doing it, pay attention. You know, on my website, I have a bunch of quotes. One of my favorites is, Stop telling yourself stories. Pay attention to what's actually happening. And that's what we're doing all the time. All right. So stop doing anything and pay attention to what's happening. Yeah, it's very valuable. But then you'll have to start doing it again to get yourself fed. So. I wanted to ask between uh, your book and your retreat, you mentioned uh, that you have had experience of, of having done at least you know, retreat for a week or so. Are there any other qualifications or characteristics of such a retreat that would be an introduction to your retreat? Well, it needs to be a silent retreat, okay? I mean, you could go do a Tibetan retreat, but it's not really silent or something. So a, a silent retreat. Uh, and it would be helpful if you're familiar with working with your breath and or metta and or the body scan. Um, and there, I mean, pretty much any retreat that's sort of an insight retreat at Spirit Rock would probably work. Uh, retreats with Goenka. All of, Goenka sends me very well prepared students. I mean, it's boot camp. So, <laughs> um, Shenzhen Young is a very good teacher. He sends me the best prepared students of any, any teacher. Um, you know, there's IMS on the East Coast. If you go to retreats back there, again, they're teaching you the same sort of stuff as at Spirit Rock. I had always learned to sit with my eyes slightly open and then close them. Um, like, maybe I don't think that's correct. What seems to be to work best is what you're familiar with. I had one student, I remember. <laughs> He was a Zen student and he'd always done open eye meditation. He came on a retreat and he was having a terrible time until he took his cushion, turned around, pointed at the wall, opened his eyes, and then he started getting in the eyes immediately. <laughs> you know, battling with the closed eyes thing just didn't work for him. So uh, whatever you're used to, if you don't know, then go with the closed eyes simply because it's less distraction. But if you're familiar with doing with eyes open, it seems to work this way. I'm already over time. I'll, I'll stay as long as you want to ask questions. All right, so two last things. All right. September 20th. Who knows what's happening September 20th? Oh, my God. Nobody. Yeah, yeah, good. There's a, a worldwide climate strike. September 20th. This is really important. Okay, promote it any way you can. Get everybody else. You know, we're in, I think the technical term is deep doo doo. <laughs> All right, things are getting really bad. The last year from the 1st of May of last year till this April 30th is the wettest year ever. And that's not even speaking about the fires that are already burning in northern BC, northern Alberta, northern Ontario. 
right? And the floods they're having in Arkansas right at this moment, and we're in trouble. And the only way it's going to change is if we make a big enough ruckus. All right. So September twentieth. This is this is the most important thing I probably have told you this weekend. All right. I mean, if you can do eight jhanas and you can't breathe, it doesn't do any good. Right. And the last thing is a tiny bit of metta. So. Do you like being happy? You like being happy? Is that a good thing? Yeah, it's a good thing when you're happy. May we all be happy. You like it when your friends are happy? Yeah. May all my friends be happy. What if all your acquaintances were happy? Your neighbors, your coworkers, people in stores and restaurants, they were happy. Would that be a good thing? Yeah, may all my acquaintances be happy. If the difficult people were happy, maybe they wouldn't be so difficult. You know, happiness has to be earned in a karmically healthy way. But yeah, even if the difficult people could find a way to be happy in a karmically good way, that'd be good. In fact, you know, if everybody on this planet was happy, wow, that'd be a place I'd like to. May all beings everywhere be happy. Thank you. They say one of the best ways to make karma is share the Dharma. So I appreciate <laughs> sharing the Dharma with all of you. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for making this space happen. Yeah, we're doing a really good thing here. And yeah, come back and do dependent origination sometime. <laughs> what? May I say a word or two? Certainly. Um, thank you, Lee, very much for your teaching and uh, your openness to all these questions. Mm -hmm. I know I learned a lot, and I'm sure everyone else did too. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you to everyone for coming. We're thrilled to have so many new faces here and some faces who we've seen before. We're the San Francisco Dharma Collective, and we are an entirely volunteer-run uh, center that's been up and running for about seven months. And we uh, try to bring a diversity of teachers in. So if this is your first time here, check our calendar. There might be other things you're interested in. Some of the things Lee was talking about, you might I like peripheral topics that relate to them. Um, we do uh, appreciate and need donations to whatever extent you're able to give. Please do. And uh, Donna, some of it will go to Lee, and some of it will go to keeping our lights on and um, the room clean and the rent paid most of all. And uh, and you'll be paying forward so other people can come into the space when we say.